All right, good day everyone and welcome to week two of Unpacking More Equal Animals. This is a series, an 11 week series where we're going through every chapter in the book More Equal Animals by Dan Larimer. Um, my name is Brandon Lovejoy, I'm an Eden community member and I'm joined by these illustrious gentlemen who are also members of the Eden community. Would you guys care to uh, give a little intro, Chris? Yes, uh, thanks, Brandon. I'm Chris Barnes, an Eden on EOS community member, and I'm reading Dan's book for the first time. So this is a great push so I can read it. I've owned it for a while. I listened to it, but now reading it, it's, uh, it's better. So glad to be here. Awesome. Joshua? Sure, yeah. Thanks, uh, gentlemen, for being here. I'm Joshua Seymour. You can call me Josh. Um, a, somewhat of a new face in the EOS community. Recently, uh, chief, chief, one of the chief delegates of the most recent Eden trial election. Fan of uh, Dan the Man, and a millennial entrepreneur currently living in uh, Central Mexico, enjoying fatherhood, trying to be the change I want to see in the world. Awesome. Mark. Yeah, Mark Shear, uh, a member of Eden and uh, interested in this uh, new fundamentals uh, applied to uh, standing up a way to uh, solve for the governance problem or for the soft subjective issues that computers can't uh, handle. Uh, it's subtle in the cryptocurrency space and uh, we're uh, all I think commonly taking interest in that that uh, governance or control layer of what everyone out there can appreciate that is our cryptocurrencies so uh, that's uh, pretty much why I'm drawn to this and here now hi I'm Ami and uh, I'm uh, one of the Eden uh, members and uh, actually won the second mock trial election. And um, I'm, I'm reading the book uh, in Hebrew uh, after reading it in English several times. And um, I'm really interested in, uh, in blockchain, in the technology and in smart contracts and what it can do to society. And uh, the book talks about uh, bridging the hard algorithmic uh, smart contracts and the soft uh, skills that you need with uh, coming to agreement amongst people, not amongst computers. So interesting. Hey guys, I'm Jesse. I'm also a relatively new face in the EOS community. Um, I'm an Eden member. I'm focused on marketing on EOS with EOSBs. Um, I'm drawn to this by the style of the election, um, super cool. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a sports fan and kind of reminds me of March Madness a little bit. Um, so I kind of love the design and, and excited to dive into the book uh, to learn more. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to add that if anyone is uh, joining us today on the live stream, feel free to put your comments in the uh, comment box. And um, if you have any bits of, um, if you're reading along with us, um, feel free to highlight any bits that you want us to, to look at. Um, and yeah, this is an 11 week series, so there's uh, nine weeks left. So you can catch up with us. If you haven't started reading the book, I recommend grab a, there's a free PDF, there's an ebook, there's, um, a print copy, which you're not going to get for three weeks. So um, <laughs> maybe stay digital, but um, for now. But uh, yeah, feel free to join us in the comments. Um, cool. Chris is on the note taking, and um, we're starting off with chapter two true democracy. Um, <clears throat> who wants to kick it off? I, I can since I'm steering. Uh, I go through the parts that I had. So um, this highlight, actually, this blue one came from uh, Jesse's reading the 
the Kindle version, which interestingly shows the most highlighted bits. And so this is from the Kindle highlight. Democracy can be viewed as an attempt to govern society according to a consensus of the majority. Interesting point, talking about kind of mob rule. Um, I did not highlight that, however. My highlight from the section, uh, the problem isn't the lack of knowledge. It is the expectation that people should even need political knowledge in the first place. That was actually, no, that's Jesse. I got JJ. I pre-highlighted yours because you came yours in advance. So I stole your thunder to read your spot. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was a, a kind of a really neat way to put it um, because, yeah, like what is political knowledge? It's It's just knowledge of the people that are representing you. And does that need to be like a separate uh, categorization? Um, and I think Dan's saying no, it's just knowledge and it shouldn't be um, politically uh, biased, I guess. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting way to put it. Yeah, and, and curious too, like where do we get our political knowledge from? So it, it, that comes up later Obviously, we'll we'll get there about the control of media, but uh, but it's not like we all have this equal open access to unbiased sources of political quote unquote knowledge, right? So it's all curated in advance before it gets into our heads. Um, so yeah, it's a bit tricky. Uh, so other bits I highlighted: true democracy Im uh, implements a process that harnesses the wisdom of the crowd and systematically protects against the need for global knowledge to make sound, independent decisions um so key there to remember that when dan's using the term true democracy he's creating a, a difference between the current forms of democracy and what should be a true form of democracy um and then i think the last bit i had on that only once we can only once we can agree on the limits if any on the power of government can we begin discussing how that power could be used and who should wield it because it's uh, i find often we don't talk about limits of government. Maybe sometimes conservatives might mention it as part of their kind of ways to entice people to vote for them, but they don't, I, I, I yet to see that turned into action very often. <laughs> and for me, okay, last highlights in this section, consent is key to maintaining long-term legitimacy, legitimacy in the eyes of the population. So again, consent, do we all agree by uh, the process and, and how uh, democracies rolling out these days and whether you use an election or not all people ultimately organize themselves into leaders and followers and power is effectively delegated there is no escaping the need to delegate power so we should find the best possible or least bad approach <clears throat> that's what i had does that line up with uh what you guys had or yeah, um, I've underlined a bit more going back to the beginning. Um, I thought it was worth taking a moment to just tackle like the opening definition of democracy or the attempt to wrap one's head around democracy. He says, democracy is generally understood as a government of, by, and for the people However, there are many forms of democracy, including direct democracy, deliberative democracy, representative democracy, democratic republics, etc. Within all these forms of democracy, there are countless ways of counting the votes, each of which attempts to determine a fair outcome that represents the people. Um, I just thought it was worth noting that democracy isn't a, like there is no such thing as just democracy. There's many different forms of democracy and, you know, we're gonna start splitting hairs here because we need to. And um, um, mm -hmm. and I of thought course, like a lot of- Of course, the model that we're talking about that's not mentioned in the book is fractal democracy. <clears throat> right, so yeah, this book is proposing a new form of democracy essentially. And I like a lot of Dan's questions. In fact, I think I would like to just do, I'm gonna go through this book and just pull out all the questions because he asks so many good questions. And the bottom of that page is, are some democratic 
or are some de democracies better at representing the will of the people and protecting the right of the people to change their government? And then he, of course, goes on. Um, the top of the next page on 22 is, democracy can be viewed as an attempt to govern society according to a consensus of the majority. And then I've underlined, what good is an election if the rules are unable to prevent cheating? Um, where is that one? It's, uh, you see where it says Jason Brennan? It's one up from... Oh, right here. Yeah. It, oh, right, right, good is an election. Here we go. Yeah. That's a good point, eh? Yeah. What is the good of an election? Um, you just cheat. It's worth also noting that that he, you rarely see Dan call out an author like this. Um, anywhere, um, I think Nassim Taleb was the only other person I've ever seen Dan call out like this. And he says in his book Against Democracy, he outlines all the ways that dinos fail, democracies in name only. Um, I just think it's worth maybe we should. And it wants to like. We should dive into that book at some point and see, because uh, he says like I would go. I would love to incorporate much of his work to demonstrate the problems of democracy. So it's worth noting that that book is apparently a great indictment of current forms of the ways that democracies fail. And that phrase dino is also kind of helpful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Democracy in name only. Mm -hmm. An apt description for dinosaur governance systems that devour their population like an uncontrollable monster. <laughs> And then at the bottom, I also, I really want to make this into a pie chart. I was going to try to do it before today, but I didn't get a chance. But like when he, he highlights that Brennan notes on a test of political knowledge, 25% of the voters were well-informed, 25 badly informed, and 25% are know-nothings, and 25 are systematically misinformed, meaning that it's easier, it's you're better taking your advice from the toss of a coin than from the population. I thought that was a very interesting little note that kind of underscores why rational ignorance and uh, other things that we haven't talked about yet are, you know. Sy systematically is interesting. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right. Systematically oh. misinformed. That's a key word there because that, yeah, that implies the system, <laughs> not just And then, just the outcome of life. Let's see. The only um, other stuff I have underlined that you guys didn't already get is, yeah, I mean, the summation of that is how how is democracy supposed to represent the best interests of the people when the people are not just rationally ignorant, but the quality of their knowledge is statistically worse than random guessing. And then your political knowledge one that you already... Oh, okay, and then here's an affirmative statement about like the process that he's trying to create. Um, everyone has some unique knowledge that is valuable. You'll find it. Um, I got it under the. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one has all the knowledge that is necessary. True democracy implements a process that harnesses the wisdom of the crowd and systematically protects against the need for global knowledge to make sound, independent decisions. Um, I guess I have two more things I underlined before the end of that section. One is on the very, very last two paragraphs of the section, um, another call to action. We must step back from the political issues and establish a new process for reaching consensus and establishing consent. And I think you already have that consent is key to maintaining long-term legitimacy. Yep. And there is no... Yep, there's no escape in the need to delegate power. Yep, yeah, that's it. Excellent. Yeah, lots of stuff to highlight in this section. Yeah, tons. 
What do you have, Mark? Any uh, any bits? Yeah, I'll try. Uh, you haven't covered. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a handful of bits, and I think what I'd like to do is just go down them swiftly, like bullet points. Uh, simply the the Brennan comment about how a coin flip would be better than the democracy we have now. That makes sense because our democracy is so biased and uh, run away that I like that quick one too. That is a coin flip would be better. So it goes in the theme of randomness yeah. in general, but in this specific chapter, he does, he does provide that, that great coin flip piece with Brennan. Uh, next one is a big fundamental where you got to straighten out independence precedes freedom precedes Liberty. So you're mm -hmm. like, huh? I don't get it. And then you're like, well, let me give you an analogy. A teen is in the tyranny of the parent household. It wants to go out. So it does, but it also wants all the goodness that the parents provide. Well, that's the teen. Oh. Go ahead. You're, you're moving sections. You're moving into a new section, I think, right? That, that comes later. Yeah. So the teen analogy is in this um, chapter, but yeah. maybe it's in a forward section. I can back out. I can back out of that. That's fine. Sorry, that yes, was say that. that. We'll, we'll give you a chance to go back. Yeah. Yeah. So everything forward for me is in forward sections. So um, if that's a thank you for catching that. I think it'd just be nice, easier to follow along if we just do this like chronologically rather than jumping to the end and then jumping back to the beginning. And yeah, yeah so, I'm with you though, Mark. Very good. That, that part so was Dan awesome. Dan does a yeah. good job kind of defining democracy, ex explaining that there's different kinds of democracies, and then there's a lot of emphasis on a process. Mm -hmm. um, there's, even a, there's even a statement um, that I make few arguments about how the power of government should be used. Instead, I focus almost entirely on the process of delegating that power to individuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really crucial. Is that is that in this first section? Yep, it's at the um, like top that. of page twenty-four, bottom of page twenty-three, under the limits that you oh, highlighted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll highlight that as well. Yeah, I make a few arguments. Yep, I had that underlined too. I guess. Yeah, I got one more in that section real quick. It's right there at the end. So, what? and you guys covered it a little, I, I listened in and, and you covered it on some level, but this last paragraph for whether you use an election or not, all people mm -hmm. ultimately organize themselves into leaders and followers and power is effectively delegated. So we all know that, but, um, yeah. The deep dive, the deep dive on how that's organized with pre-selection, and all of the mechanics of control. That's what will flow into in the next numbers of sections. Yeah, I find this one an interesting comment when you consider it with like some of those uh, anarcho-capitalist type of anarchy, you know, without ruler. But it's like, how do you you still if this is a truism? that people will ultimately organize, organize themselves into leaders and followers, then can we all just be anarchy of sorts without rulers and just doing our own thing on an island? Seems to be contradictory. And do you want well, to, uh, to uh, strive to that system? I don't think we want that, right? Even if it, it's an option, you don't want to be in a situation where uh, somebody takes control using power and uh, you just uh, delegate by default. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. If, if there isn't a, a system or a process to delegate power, then it is just defaulted. Default delegation. Yeah. And just to speak up for the anarchists for a second, it's, it's probably like one of the closest um, political things I identify with. Um, and there are many flavors of anarchism, and I don't know that this, you know, but I just wanted to say that, you know, anarchists aren't against rules, and Dan kind of gets into this. It's just, you get a bunch of anarchists together and, like, see if they can, you can get them to agree on how to define the rules, and, like, that's the tricky part. 
But um, yeah. delegating authority or delegating power to like a member of the group is done all the time in anarchist circles. It's usually just really messy on how we get there and <clears throat> really ugly and turns everybody off. It's like gnarly consensus process. So that's why I think this book is so awesome because it's like here, you can have consensus and hierarchy together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hierarchy or anarchy, what did you say? Hierarchy or, or anarchy? I Well, you can have both, you know? Really? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Anarchy, hierarchy, hierarchy, anarchy, anarchy. <laughs> hierarchy, anarchy. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, Anyone want to take a shot at summarizing that first uh, s section? Josh already did kind of a good job. Yeah, I mean, I'll just mention it again there. You know, there's the definition of democracy, uh, the mention of the different kinds of democracy, and uh, that there has to be a process. There is a need. It is necessary to have a process. And I like, I really like what you just said there, Ami. If there isn't a process, then that's your default process that you don't have one, which makes a lot of sense about the different anarchy communities. Um, you know, even even they um, need a way of reaching consensus and delegating power, but um, if they don't have a suitable process that kind of makes sense to them. And I think a lot of anarchist leaning people probably like fractal governance. I think it think it makes sense logically. Mm -hmm. Any points that Josh missed that anyone feels are really crucial to that first section? Uh, no, I, would I guess, add, yeah, it's pretty good. It, yeah, go ahead. I would just add consent is key to maintaining long term legitimacy. That's a good segue into the next section. Also, I think uh, Dan is hinting or leading to uh, the problem of scale, because uh, sometimes you can have a pretty good democracy on a small scale, but when you get to millions of people, then you get to compromise. You have to choose between a few people with a bucket of ideas about different uh, subjects, and you like their ideas about one subject and the other people's idea about another subject but you have to pick one and it's like a package deal and you don't like that it doesn't work in scale mm -hmm. you know uh marcelino is watching and he put a comment up at least we should agree how to agree mm -hmm. exactly. hi no no <laughs> no no good to see you we mm -hmm. should agree how to agree at least we should agree. That's a good sutra or like a little summation. At least we should agree how to agree. Can we agree yeah. that we should agree how to agree? Yeah, it could I be agree. a bumper sticker. Yeah, that's a, oh, that's a great <laughs> summation. I think Nuno wins the, the first section summation. Yeah. Um, um, cool. All power comes from consent. You guys ready for the next? Next section. Should we do it? Yes. Um, you know, comment. <laughs> nice. Take it away, Brandon. You got spots highlighted. Um, I do. Before I, s I don't see anything on your page yet. Um, let's see here. I I highlighted in that first paragraph. Uh, we can therefore restate the problem of governance yeah. as a consensus building problem. Yep. And it's, it's governance, not government. Um, we can restate the problem of governance as a consensus building problem and that a successful society implements a governmental process that protects the people's ability to reach a new consensus. And I would even highlight back to the challenge because I think that's a, that's the first part of this idea in a way. It's like the challenge is coordinating enough people to reach a new consensus on who should be in power. And then, yeah, I love that he restates the problem of governance as consensus building. And now we can just talk about building consensus instead of 
thinking about this amorphous governance problem. Yeah, it simplifies the concept. And so, um, in the, yeah, and the read, just to read the bit that you mentioned, Brandon, the challenge of getting out from under a corporate dictator or corrupt dictator or party system is coordinating enough people to reach a new consensus on who should be in power. Yeah, who, key, key point there, right? Right now, the, the who's are definitely pre-selected for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, um, we have an illusionary democracy. <laughs> democracy in name only is that a type of democracy <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i would prefer a, de a democracy of illusionists that'd be cool if like <laughs> david copperfield and other people would be like selected as president because they were the best illusionists i would totally get down with something like that we don't even have that um the, the only the next thing I have highlighted um, is once a political system becomes corrupt, it is impossible to use the system to fix it. That's on the next page. Yeah, I've got it down here. Maybe we just maybe it's better we just go on and then you guys jump in as I scroll. That might be more efficient. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can just watch on your screen and pick up anything. Go, go in order and then you jump. So as we go to here, now we've got the blue, and this is the Kindle, Kindle highlight. <laughs> Pay attention to any content that is censored. It almost always indicates a threat to those in power and knowledge likely you need to know. That's Wait, uh, where is that? Pretty, pretty interesting. Blue. Yeah, the Kindle, they seem to um, highlight kind of like the basic or practical stuff. Um, not too complex. It's kind of what I found so far reading the Kindle version. What page is that? Uh, it's second page in, uh, of this section, like right after we just started. Oh, often it is easy. OK, I found it. And just maybe to um, give a bit of background into how the Kindle highlight works, it's like a, a certain. Um, if a certain percentage of the readers highlight a particular passage, it will show to all the readers reading that Kindle version that this has been the most highlighted. And at least compared to chapter one, chapter one, there was only one Kindle highlight. And in chapter two, there was three Kindle highlights. So mm -hmm. perhaps we can use it just as a way to gauge which chapters were more popular than others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, and then I've, I've highlighted uh, the truth. Truth does not require censorship. However, lies depend upon censorship of truth. I think I gotta, I gotta use that in my Eden song. I'm real, you know, it's, I'm, re I'm, I'm writing great, a song about Chris. Eden and I, I suck, I suck at lyrics. And, uh, so I think this is going to be a, I'm just going <laughs> to take bits you of just, Dan's book and start using yeah, the lyrics. Yeah, yeah totally. Just mind <laughs> the book. Kind of yeah. Like like a rap song yeah. or like a no I, I play guitar so it's like oh, blink, okay. blink blink 182 or something like, Some new like, a, punk, like a punk rock song then more incubus i'm more like a ballad this is more like a ballad or acoustic rock incubus type of uh okay. days of the new type of thing <laughs> it'll be out soon i'm gonna try to get it out in the next couple of weeks i just need to fix my lyrics my first run at lyrics were a bit uh, nickelback-esque so we're gonna try to improve on those <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, just jump in, fellas, and I'll, I'll keep going here. So the next part I've got highlighted, the, the corrupt powers that be will intentionally divide the population with propaganda and political favors to hinder their ability to work together. So hindering the population's ability to work together. And we see that, <clears throat> I think, today in you know modern this uh, <clears throat> kind of COVID lockdown stuff, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of not getting together and not talking. I even, you know, in Australia, I heard that even Andrews, their prime minister said, even if you're at the grocery store and your neighbor's there, do not stop and talk to your neighbor. God. It's like, Jesus. no, no talking. And the only way you can communicate now is going to be through social media, which you guessed it is censored. So good luck coming up with uh, any sort of working togetherness. Yeah. It's censored even. and manipulated. Yeah. 
And then I've got, once a political system becomes corrupt, it is impossible to use the system to fix it. So key, the system, just he mentioned systematic issues earlier. So here the political system is corrupt and therefore you can't use that same system to fix it, right? Like we have political leaders who we, who've kind of created modern politics that's created the problems we have today. And yet we're gonna then look to that same system to vote in a, a cure, a solution. That's uh, naive at its best. I had that same one highlighted. As we go through these, I'm imagining like a lot of social sharing images. Um, for, like for all of these different uh, quotes or parts of the book. This will be a really good like, one-liner. Like what do you mean social sharing images? Like like images that can go go viral um, with mm. uh, quote quotes on them. Mm. And uh, uh, yeah. the way that they're designed is... And there could be different renditions. Um, but... Yeah, there's cool. so many different poss possibilities, but that's something like, that would help get the message out if, with the work that we're doing here. 100%. Um, if you guys don't mind to pause for just a second, um, on that note, I have a list going of ways that the we could, like the output of this text could be used, and maybe besides rap songs. Want, besides rap songs, I mean, I should write that down. Rap songs. Um, rap songs. But. Uh, Man, Freddy's uh, looking for a link. Oh, Man, Freddy, looking for someone a link. with a faster computer can. Uh, I got him. Link directly. If if I click around, I'll be lagged. I got him. Let me see here. That's link. Link uh, Hound. And I'll, I'll keep uh, reading a little more here since uh, while we're waiting to get Man, Freddy. Yeah. In, uh, about the once a political system becomes corrupt, it's possible to use the system to fix it. In theory, even though this isn't highlighted, and in theory, the population would just remove the bad actors and replace them with good actors. But in practice, this doesn't happen. This is because the problem is systematic corruption, not individual corruption. I find that curious because, for one, it takes politicians off the hook. If it's a systematic corruption piece, then maybe the individual politicians who we all loathe uh, aren't necessarily the problem. And I know in Canada that fits because Justin Trudeau is about as close to a puppet as one could get. So surely he's not the issue. He's just a shell of a greater issue. <laughs> yeah, and I think that uh, I really like that because it, it kind of brings uh, the humanity kind of back to the <clears throat> table. Um, I think we should... Uh, you know, everyone has good and bad in them. And I don't, I think it's a bit perhaps unfair to um, put all the blame on individual politicians. So I totally agree that we should focus on the, on the system and kind of not bash individual people. Exactly. Especially if we're looking for solutions to trying to fix this, because like he points out, you can remove the bad actor vector. That's, that doesn't fix the system. That's because we're, we're, we're looking at the wrong point of problem. We need to yeah, fix I think a good itself. example would be if you look at um, less developed countries and if, if a leader was to be assassinated or, or forcefully removed or, or just like scared and stepped down or something for some reason, the system is so corrupt that it would, I mean, I think a lot of us can, it's more obvious to see in a less developed country, country is so corrupt that it, whatever replaces them is going to be just as bad or worse usually and we've got mike manfredi in the house mike you want to say hello howdy guys i uh, was catching as i was trying to get find the link uh, i was catching the conversation about uh lyrics and music so uh the bad actor factor is this uh <laughs> is the band name Ooh, that's good. <laughs> that's a good the bad actor factor the bad actor factor <laughs> Damn, uh, I like. Yeah, back to the <laughs> in my song even. Mike comes out Bad swinging. <laughs> yeah. Right um, there, that actor factor. Mike probably doesn't need any introduction, but we, the, from the Clarion team, and uh, yeah, you want to introduce yourself at all? Since sure, really quick. Uh, I'm. Part of the Clarion team building building the software we uh, will use and are using and will be using for uh, fractal governance in the Eden community on the EOS blockchain. And a uh, huge fan of this book. Uh, had a big hand in editing it. Uh, read it numerous times. Took notes on it. 
super excited that we're having this conversation. Awesome. Um, just trying to put your screen back on. There we go. Oh, oh, I broke everything. There we go. I unbroke it. So, hey, real quick, before we go further, I just, um, I would really love everyone's brains for a second. Um, I've been thinking, because Josh made me remember when he said that that little uh, quote would be good for social sharing and stuff like that. As we go through the text, it'd be really cool if people would call out stuff like that. Um, like lines that are really good for, be good for like a meme or um, I have a whole list of things that I'd like to see the content we produce kind of turn into. Um, one obvious thing is, you know, Dan might be really happy to have this as feedback for future editions. Um, Josh just mentioned social sharing images. I think like a hyperlinked text would be great. And then any like, I call them sutras, but like a condensed thing like Nuno produced, that was just like a really succinct one liner that can like compact some different concepts together as those come out. And then I'm also just in my film brain thinking about like there are a lot of great scenes um, or things that could be dramatized. Like we'll get into it with the kid in his parents' house or there are some other really good stuff later on. So are there any other um, kind of- Yeah, on that note, Lovejoy, um... If, uh, if Dan wants to do it, um, this would require a budget, but <laughs> like a two minute explainer video. Um, I do personally have experience uh, creating these videos and I uh, think that would be um, our best kind of social asset if you want to do it. Cool. Um, are you talking about like a Animated thing, live yeah. action, like okay, animated. Yeah. Yeah, it'd probably probably be in the uh, five to seven thousand dollar range. You're talking about like a hand okay. Well we can talk about the details later. But cool, yeah. <clears throat> I'm all about it. I'm sure Dan would be into it too. We could script a documentary for it. Well that's my that's the other yeah goal that I'd like to see is um, some some kind of documentary around this and 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 so when I when I go through and read this book again and again I'm yeah I come he Dan actually has a lot of like really great illustrations like that could be drawn even dramatized that would be really cool whether it's an animation or a live action um, and we'll, we'll hit on some budget, though. yeah That's we'll hit on some of those well I mean you know some of us are. Yeah, we'll we can get into budget later. <laughs> Maybe, um, uh, you, you know, we could do is a, a haiku competition based on the content. Nah. <laughs> I love it. More equal animals haiku competition. Yeah. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. For the diet. Okay. That was enough of a little interlude on. But if anyone thinks of any other kind of purposes for besides haiku competitions for. Um, <laughs> what we could do with the content that we are kind of extracting. Um, that'd be really cool to hear. Just shout it out as it occurs to you. Chris, where are we? Uh, we're now moving into where Dan talks about the Declaration of Independence. And I have highlighted this bit where he uh, sort of summarizes the premise. The premise of the Declaration remains that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to the people's intent, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it the government and to instill institute a new government that I don't think is well known <laughs> to most people it's certainly not popularized by modern media and modern politicians that it's uh, if we don't think that the intent of our, our intent is being adhered to a current government we should uh, we have the right to abolish it <laughs> well I feel like you I don't get that option on the ballot I know right you, you, but you got to finish the quote I mean you can't just stop midway through the quote Wow, I was, I was, I caught myself, I was highlighting too much. So I'm reading, from, I, can't, I, can't, I can't, I have to do like an inverse highlight where I highlight the stuff I don't want because I'll use less highlighter. But uh, you read the rest, go ahead. I'll highlight it as well. 
Well, I just feel like that's like a the conclusion is laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to, to affect their safety and happiness. Very nice. Like fractal democracy. Makes me feel Elon, sad. Elon Musk says that a lot. Yeah, really? Yeah. Maximize happiness. Mm, mm. Um, <clears throat> he's a hedonist so he, so he, it looks like i think it's not popular because it's a very risky uh proposition uh yeah let's throw the whole system to the garbage and start fresh but uh that's very mm -hmm. uh gonna be very <clears throat> bloody and violent if you start from the top mm -hmm. and uh if you if you do a grassroots uh you know, like a, a small community and uh, another small community, and then they coordinate their efforts together, and uh, you grow gradually from small groups of people. Then that that can be a peaceful way of uh, improving the system without changing it abruptly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's just laying the groundwork here. He's not advocating like a violent overthrow of the government, and he gets into independence next, which is kind of like the foundational pillar that um, something new could be built on. So, You know, I, right. I, I was trying to avoid tangenting, but I think this is a valuable uh, addition rather than a tangent, so I'll go back. Uh, one thing to note in that quote as a, a, piece of, a piece of historical fascination, in when the southern states seceded, they wrote articles of secession, or declarations of secession, I think it is. Um, I highly recommend you go read some of them. Some of them are are ignorant and dumb, as you might expect. But uh, I think it was Tennessee has uh, this very there's, there's two or three of them that are super concise, like a single paragraph. And I um, well, like I said, I think it's Tennessee. Basically says we agreed to become part of this union. We expected and were promised certain things as part of this union. We're not getting those things and we're not being served by this union. So by the same authority ourselves that put us in this union, that agreed to join this union, we are taking ourselves out. It's, it's such a simple, concise statement of ownership. And I think that's something that that's lost. Like we, we really forget that, well, you're not just stuck with the government you have. You're stuck with the government you have. If you're telling yourself you're stuck with the government you have, that's, that's a. That's just not how it's been in this country. If you go back far enough, it's not the mindset. So it's really cool to check out some of those documents and see that mindset still very active in certain states. That's good to hear because certainly that's not what the uh, indoctrination slash inculcation camps, also known as public schools, tell us. Right? They just tell us about the history of government, and how it works. I, I, yep. I don't recall being taught that you can uh, you can overthrow it if you'd like if you don't agree with it. <laughs> well, you know, I want to chime in here and say I put together a two minute uh, excerpt of uh, Larimer breaking it down, at least in one alternate reality, where he says we can support two governments at once. So mm -hmm. he explains what that how that functions uh, within the context of what you we we are familiar with all of us um that is you know th there is no like overthrow side of this there's just build from within arrange yourself with leverage make trade connections be able to come and go and then eventually um, you will do the fundamentals like work with the u.s government obviously uh, but support two governments at once along the whole way until you sufficiently leveraged. Yeah, the comment from Mo DS, not advocating a violent overthrow, but is highlighting the right to start over or change what's malfunctioning. It's important that people know this and the government recognize that it's possible. Thanks for the comment. Totally agree. Well, yeah, it'd be dude. interesting if we elected <clears throat> politicians that wanted to abolish the current form of government. Elect me, so you'll never have a chance to elect me again. Ta -ta -ta. <laughs>
You guys, uh, yeah, Tennessee is at least one of the states. You guys interested in hearing that direct yeah, from uh, history? I'd like to hear it. Cool. Yes, please. I'm not an American, so yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, Declaration of Independence and Ordinance Dissolving the Federal Relations with between the state of Tennessee and the United States of America. First, we, we the people of the state of Tennessee waiving any expression of opinion as to the abstract doctrine of secession, but asserting the right as a free and independent people to alter, reform, or abolish our form of government in such manner as we think proper. Do ordain and declare that all the laws and ordinances by which the state of Tennessee became a member of the Federal Union of the United States of America are hereby abrogated and annulled, and that all the rights, functions, and powers by which any of said laws and ordinances were conveyed to the government of the United States, and to absolve ourselves from all the obligations, restraints, and duties incurred hereto, and do hereby henceforth become a free, sovereign, and independent state. There's two more paragraphs, but I just love, like, you can't say it simpler than that. We, we have this right. We're a free and independent people. That's the terms on which we, we joined this union, and those are the terms on which we're taking ourselves out. We are an independent state, period. <laughs> what, what's the date of that? Like, how old is this? Uh, this was ci Civil War, so uh, this was May 6th, 1861. So they could just, I mean, any modern state today could just recycle that and use it again, couldn't they? There's there's a mild form of it going on now where states are are taking certain areas tends to center around um, um, amendments the uh, bill of rights particular particular rights uh, where a state will declare look the constitution exists in my state the people who live in this state get that right and we're not going to enforce anything the federal government says. Generally, that started around the Second Amendment, um, but it's affected the Fourth Men Amendment, and I think in certain circumstances, the First Amendment. And it's it's the right of a state, right? It's not any place where the federal government has said, you have this right, and then produced law or produced uh, you know legislation in, in conflict with that or executive orders in conflict with that. There are states that are just declaring, yeah, that's not going to fly here. And they're, all of the local enforcement is instructed to not enforce those laws. I like it. Let's see more of that. All right, should we get back to it? Yes. There's the ciao. We, now it's the, he, he's got the actual Declaration of Independence parts of it here. Uh, I don't think we need to. Yeah. Kind of Let's. That. I highlighted the first paragraph after that. Right here. Do you want after to read the... it? Over? Do you want me to read it? Go, Josh. Yeah. Oh, go for it. Yeah. Declaring independence is vastly different from asking for privileges and concessions from the powers that be. Today, many people are fighting a war for dependence also known as the right to force others to provide them with goods and services they are unable or unwilling to earn themselves. Independence is about taking responsibility for your life and your local community. The opposite of independence is dependence. Independence is necessary for freedom. Without freedom, you are effectively <clears throat> enslaved. If you are not responsible for your life, then you become dependent upon someone who becomes responsible for you. Your slavery grows with your dependence and your freedom grows with your independence. And I think to some degree this ties back in with uh, what Mark was saying that also Dan has mentioned recently about there has, there sort of has to be a parallel um, you're, mm. We're bonded. We literally are bonded slaves to the current system that we were born into. Like our parents did that for us, and we weren't old enough to claim our own independence. We probably still haven't figured out how to do it, most of us. <laughs> Maybe it's not even something you can only do as an individual. Maybe it, it takes a group of people to really do it. Um, and there's a lot of people trying to take stabs at that kind of thing. But in the meantime, um, you can't go to war with a system that 
is designed for war, um, you're, you're going to lose that battle as many people have. Either you'll lose your life or you'll go to prison. Um, so until things get to a point where you're strong enough, like, like the other uh, confederations like Tennessee and stuff like that, where you're, you're able to... What It kind of also goes back to like your, your independence or your rights are what you can uh, defend and protect and enforce. So it's um, like, sure, you want to live by the Declaration of Independence, but, and maybe to some degree you can, but if a bully can uh, throw you off of that, then it doesn't really mean so much, and you're not as independent as you think you are. So I guess I, guess I can agree that maybe for a, a interim process, it, it, maybe we do have to live uh, in or deal with, negotiate with uh, at least two forms of, of government un until we reach a point where we no longer have to. Ideally, or things just go to shit real fast and we have no choice but to uh, pick up the pieces. <laughs> External influence. <clears throat> Can you could you pick up the pieces and I'll just depend on you? Is that is that okay? <laughs> For um, you, Brandon, I'd make an exception. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'll be over here in my it's, hammock. It's, it's it's why a lot of preppers prep for more than just themselves, because they know that there's a bunch of numbnuts out there who aren't prepping. Not saying you're numbnuts, but people who don't prep, who aren't preparing for worst case scenarios, and you know they're gonna be knocking on your door. So you're you're better off to uh prepare for more than just your own needs and your family's needs or be willing Call to it. fight them off because it, the other thing is when desperation hits and people are they're going to do more than just knock on your door yeah so you call that voice. enlightened self-interest enlightened self-interest uh um, so yeah a lot, a lot of highlighting here i feel like it's at some point when we maybe once we're done all this we'll have to uh like this should be distilled <clears throat> yeah green but it's um, all awesome Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suggest I suggest we tag this generally as we should we should pull you know t-shirts and quotables out of here. There's a lot of really yeah. good stuff in here. Uh, <clears throat> social the social media tag we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that with uh, YouTube. I'm try I'm try to um, capture video snippets, mm. but um, you know the book has a, a boatload so. As an idea, we'd like to transition into what Mike, you've just said, but with respect to like YouTube, I've already got rolling. So it's like, but I love the idea of the memes mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the social sharing. So this yeah, next section, I, I would mainly, I'm, I call that out just so we mark in the margin. Let's, let's take mm -hmm. a note, you know, social media excerpt worthy. Yeah. I'm putting notes in the private chat, by the way. Okay. I'm just marking my book up. It's got, I, I don't normally write in books, and I, I always hate when people write in books, and I buy them secondhand, and I have to deal with other people's opinions about what's important in the book. This is the first book I've ever just gone at it hard. It's just <laughs> totally butchered for all future reading. Um, <clears throat> That you next buy another, we, another copy, and that will be clean. Exactly. I, want Dan to, I want Dan to sign this book uh, eventually after it's <laughs> totally um, just <laughs> dog-eared and, and scribbled in. Um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think, Josh, did you read this last bit? Because I think I had a bit highlighted, and I've amalgamated. No, I, I didn't read the, the other part you have this, there. I, I think this is pretty interesting, too. Independence <clears throat> is yeah. necessary for freedom. Without freedom, you are effectively enslaved. That, that's an interesting one. That's not intuitively obvious, I don't think. If you are not responsible for your life, then you become dependent on someone who becomes responsible for you. Your slavery grows with your dependence and your freedom grows with your independence. And then, and then <clears throat> Jesse had highlighted this bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Jesse's yeah. back. Fighting, fighting for independence just kind of struck me. Um, just personally, in my own life, I'm I'm trying to become more free, but but um, 
it should I should try to become more independent. I think there's kind of a key difference. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, and I note, I note on I right. note on this that uh, people, a couple of people in my life who are who are real hard philosophy linguistic people, point out slavery usually involves some kind of ownership, some explicit ownership. And so it's interesting to note that while we can call this slavery and hand wave that we know what we mean by that, um, it's kind of interesting to consider, well, are you, are you, are we born into some form of slavery or are we unaware of our dependence and I, I, you know, in, in, I'll call out the negative side of it, lazy in our non-effort to get out of it, to build our own independence. Mm -hmm. right? Building independence is really hard. You decide that, yeah, I don't want Google tracking me, so I'm not going to use G Suite. Man, that's a, that's a hard road for a lot of people. You know, look at all the tech we use every day. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't make us a slave. We are voluntarily using this technology. We're voluntarily doing a lot of stuff in life. We voluntarily shop at Walmart. I'm not saying all of we on this call, but <laughs> uh, those are voluntary, those are volitional things. Yeah. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that. Yeah, and, and the idea of ownership versus de dependence or you know, maybe, maybe that ownership, maybe we should start looking at slavery more as dependence as Dan is saying here, and it makes it more practical. Like, okay, so I'm enslaving myself with all these places where I'm allowing this dependence to be. Mo has a good comment here. It's cyclical. What modern society has done is debilitate its members into dependence, which makes its members continually weaker and more dependent. Yeah, vicious cycle. Lovejoy, you had a hand up. Yeah, well, I wanted to highlight some of these comments um, that Chris just did. And then I also had a footnote on the term slavery, which <clears throat> I think could be, in many cases, replaced with something a little more neutral and accurate, like bondage, like to be born <laughs> in bondage or something like that. Because indentured servitude. Indentured servitude. Yes, yeah, servitude is a good one, um, whether it's indentured or not. Yeah, the, um, the legal definition in the U.S. is like you're a bonded, bonded surety to a bankrupt corporation. Yeah, I think bondage is a really good, um, you know, <clears throat> phrase minus the S and M connotations, but um, it's a. Uh, yeah, I think it's more accurate because it's not like as people are. I mean, slavery just has some pretty violent American connotations in particular, and it more evokes images of people like literally bound in chains and being sold at markets. So um, just a personal preference. Um, Joe, but this, hey, real quick, subordinate, you know, cause mm -hmm. these are like automaton responses where <clears throat> yes, we are born into it. We have to really work to increase the independence like Mike was saying so that uh, can bring more clarity because I don't like the word slavery either. Dan loves it. <laughs> he's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to pull that one up too. Yeah. Mo says here, exactly. Mike hit the nail on the head. I disagree though with the fact that one can't become a slave through one's own volition in ancient Rome. This was common practice to pay one's debts. Actually, I I uh, read recently that sl slavery <clears throat> used to really be more like employment, and employment used to be um, a different kind of contract that was like pretty pretty long term. So the I think slavery has sort of been twisted quite a bit, but it's very empowering to just real to just put it in the simplicity of dependence versus independence and you can increase you can take steps to increase your independence you can work with other people to collectively increase your independence and and then uh you're you're more empowered there's something you can do about it and something you can work with other people to do about it it's not some elusive um thing that you can never like get out of or that you have to fight such a struggle to get out of it i mean i'm yeah. not saying it's easy but it it 
you know, like right. doing the right things long enough consistently, you will get the results that you want. Okay, I just want to read this next section <clears throat> that we haven't gotten to yet. It is interesting that our society talks frequently about fighting for freedom and democracy, but almost never talks about fighting for independence. And I would go a little further. I like independence is the foundation of freedom and democracy. Freedom and democracy don't necessarily give you independence. Independence requires self-reliance and responsibility. <clears throat> I like that because it, it indicates that, yeah, it states right, you know, outright that independence is the foundation that freedom and democracy have to be built on. You can't, you can't do it the other way around. Yeah, freedom and democracy are the outcome, not, not the input. Um, <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and that, you know, else, you know, let's call that one out. Yeah, I like exactly. uh, the independence. The independence is like very actionable. And it's mysterious to us right now, but it's very something we can really try to get to understand better uh, with like things we're tied into like right now. So uh, I, I like uh, I like what was said moments ago. Um, I don't have everyone's name here, but uh, it's uh, Jesse. You said it. Well, this is interesting. So we talk about, yeah, like how do you define independence, right? So we need, if because people, freedom and democracy don't necessarily give you independence. Independence requires self-reliance responsibility. And here, independence is a precondition to consent. And consent is a precondition to legitimate democratic government. Yeah, so I, I think that it, it's really helpful to define, like kind of define how to get freedom and that, means being independent and i think understanding what to do to achieve independence is a lot more clear than than freedom yeah very good thank you i really like this one it is perhaps easy to visualize this as a difference between a teenager wanting freedom to live his life however he likes while still living under his parents roof eating their food and driving their car <laughs> <clears throat> and Kindle highlighted next from that, seeking freedom while remaining dependent is to seek your freedom at the expense of someone else. That is a problem with today. That's got a sting to read if you're in that camp. Um, or you just like, this is stupid. I don't agree with this. <laughs> well, um, I wonder what, how does a Marxist respond to that? What are they going to say? It's about injustice then, and it's because it's the capitalists and who, who are the problem, and we need to, like, those are the people we need to. It's their expense that we should be seeking, not not our individual. Well, military. there's a continuum here that I think gets lost on a lot of people, and you know, we'll get to ism schism here later, right? Um, mm -hmm. But um. You know, the beauty of this book is, and we haven't gotten there exactly, but it it kind of comes full circle. So it ends up, you know, it's proposing a system that kind of takes care of everybody and it does so on a foundation of independence. And I've, you know, I've peppered Dan with questions about independence. Like, well, I was like, isn't independence really just mutual, like interdependence? And, you know, you can go down that rabbit hole <clears throat> um, and talk about society, but I think it is pretty clear that the cornerstone is independence um, of individuals, whether they're in relationship to a community or their environment around them, um, you know, is kind of not the issue. Because um, of course, we will find independence like in groups in, you know, as an individual, as a group, as a community, as a, you know, bioregion, as a it's so forth. Layered. It's layered, but it has to begin at the smallest possible unit. <clears throat> it's almost like an, it's independence has to have an aspect that is also centered around voluntary reliance. Because if you, I'm looking out my window here at like birds and trees and just everything, like there isn't, is there anything that's truly independent in nature? 
or I mean, every, everything is somewhat, I mean, there, there's an, an like we're, it's, it's tricky because it, yeah. there is always dependencies. We're dependent on plants to breathe. We're dependent mm-hmm. on gravity to hold us to the earth. So there is, I mean, there is inextricable dependencies, dependencies. It's just, they need to be, you be sort of, you need to accept them or at least be voluntarily willing to go along with them or, or the, or, or the ability to succeed, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Really. I think, uh, two, two things. One is increase independence, but I like the interdependence is, this, is the state of things, but the goal in this book is to increase independence. And I think two is to scope like what we're trying to be independent of. So you have to bring it into like the, economic uh place that we've all set up as a civilization and we're not talking about dependencies over our bodies our digestion the way we you know what i mean so you have to scope it for well what are we what are we trying to in, you know independence intervention uh, okay well in a political or cooperative civilization realm so you really got to bring vision mm-hmm. and scope to to what it is you're trying to you know manage yeah, I think that's a, a really critical point um, and to, to make it really, really extreme. We are dependent on the sun. We are dependent on the earth, right? So we're really, really, really clear, at least until Elon has his way. Um, we, we will always have dependence and we will always have certain independences. I think it's, uh, it is a matter of scope, and it'd be interesting to actually define that. I was trying to think through that with you, Mark, and I couldn't couldn't quite scope it, uh, articulate that scoping accurately. Uh, but that would be really valuable valuable to do because it's not just are we dependent, are we independent, or are we inter- interdependent. Even interdependency isn't really a thing. That's kind of like that describes some state between the two. We know we're dependent on certain things, and independence as a standalone, you know, I am alone in the world. How valuable is that anyway? Does, mm-hmm. does that encroach on your freedom to relate to others? You know, <laughs> So uh, scoping this would be a really cool side conversation to have someday. Mm-hmm. Future podcast. I yeah. think uh, we may yeah, be a little, idea. we may be a little guilty of the labeling that we, was warned about in the last chapter. I think uh, independence is a spectrum, and uh, you know you could be more or less dependent. Yeah, and 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 it applies in different contexts. So, like when we're getting into the final chapters, like transforming society, transforming yourself, the the different aspects of society and yourself. Maybe you want more uh, dependence or interdependence. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it seems like ecosystems are have a lot of interdependence, but it seems also layered that the different, uh, let's say, the animals in the ecosystem, they independently like do things oftentimes, and sometimes they do things in groups also, and uh, not everyone pulls their own weight and all that. It's a very interesting analogy, more equal animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's... um. Let's earmark this independence conversation for like a, I think, I think it is a worthy topic for a whole separate podcast as Mike indicated, because it's really deep and we could, we could talk about this for a while and I think it would be very profitable to talk about. Um, but in the interest of continuing on. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm noticing we've got a long, we're on page, we've got another 10 pages to go here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so uh, I don't know where I kind of lost track of where we are. I had page twenty-eight. Moving into the talk about the teenager. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I could have. I think I found a lot of this was useful, especially to talk about his roommates. What teenagers really want is independence. They want the ability to make their own choices. If they cannot carry the full responsibility of independent <clears throat> living living, then they can find the next best thing, living with a roommate or several. In this case, the teenager trades the tyrannical rules of his parents, the government he was born under, for the hopefully more acceptable consensus rules of his roommates, a peace treaty chosen by him and his roommates. He still has chores, limits on noise, and limits on having friends over, but is hopefully enjoying more liberty because he consented. 
than he had under his parents' roof while there was no, where there was no negotiation. Uh, could you um, draw a bracket around that entire section and just write, um, yeah, from the what teenagers down to kick him out? Um, that's like a great thing to for like a documentary to visualize. Like, I imagine yes. the teen, I imagine the teenager. You know, you could just visualize like reaching some sort of consensus on rules and then enjoying. I think it's a very great illustrative. Um, <clears throat> nice. Um, and then that's a great quote you've highlighted there. Fighting for independence is fighting for the right to take care of yourself, to live and let live. I completely can resonate with this. Just leave me alone. <laughs> I don't know um, if anyone has anything between here and there, but I the next thing I've uh, underlined is independence begins as a mental state of being, which when acted out results in reducing your dependence on the status quo while organizing and respecting a parallel system of consensus. Uh, did you, is there a new page? Did you go to a new page for that? No, it's on the same page. You just went past it. Oh, it was above. It's just right below that. Um, it's like uh, under many people. Oh, right here. And then a little further down, it says independence begins as a oh, mental state of yeah, being. Right Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Anybody else? Uh, am I missing anything that you guys have highlighted here before scroll? Uh, no, but I did want to quick point out that uh, when Dan provides these uh, like metaphors or like these little uh, scenarios, I'm paying more and more attention to those because they're helping me bite size this. So the, uh, the 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 teen with the tyranny of the household image is is perfect for the example of that. So I'm just looking mm -hmm. for more and more of those. Try to try to aggregate those, and assemble them. Mm -hmm. This is interesting too. The more dependent we are on our parents, the harder it is to move out and enjoy the freedom derived from the responsibility of independence. And here you can sub out parents for government. The more dependent <laughs> we are on our government, the harder it is to move out. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. This next section really speaks to the whole interdependence uh, quality. Um, the first act of you you're, you went it's right before the means i just have it kind of underlined the first act of independence is to reach out to your neighbor and invite them to join you in creating a new social contract and a new process for reaching consensus so like right off the bat like dan here is saying like you know really like the first step of independence is like forming an agreement with another person which is kind of yep. interesting and then at the bottom, Communi even the best. Communicating with them, right? The first sort of independence is actually talking to other people, <laughs> not just to go isolate yourself on an island. Right, right. Because, you know, what sort of meaningful independence can you really have, like, all by yourself? Um, and then the very last statement in that paragraph below is, even the best form of government is at the mercy of the prevailing virtues of the people being governed. I thought that's another inescapable truism, which is like, you know, you can have the the best rules and the best ideas, and if the people that you're trying to like put it together with all are total ignoramuses and hateful, bile-filled people, like, well, so much for your great intentions, it's not going to work, you know, because you need quality, virtuous people to try and implement a system. That's tricky, eh? Where do virtues come from, though? Are those in societally imposed? Are we, are we I thought they were innate, innate sets of virtues? They come from they TV, right? don't they? Oh, I thought they it was the muses. Like, like, don't the gods, gods just yourself. hand out virtues? Yeah, because it's well, it's an important point in the end. Because if we're if we're in the end, like this is, if we're at <laughs> the mercy of prevailing virtues, then we almost like that almost seems like a that we have to fix that first. 
Well, this is this is. I mean, to go back to like a. Uh, I don't want to knock on Google. I'll switch to Apple. You know, if you want to get free of <laughs> Apple Cloud or iPhone, uh, or iCloud or iPhone, um, it, it's not easy. Like you've got this whole list of services and this amazing Photos app and all this stuff that you're used to. And when you switch gears, you're like, all right, well, a, how am I? What is it going to take to gain independence from that? But then when you get to, oh, and I'm just going to assume certain things because I've spent a lot of time exploring this and there's a lot of caveats on what I'm about to say. But let's say you find some alternative and you're like, you know, I'm going to host my own system and run it myself. I'm going to host some, you know, server that provides me the services I want. Well, now you're paying server cost. Do you, do you get your family involved, get a few friends and split that cost? Do you do you want to have the guy with the virtues who uploads you know terabytes of stuff when everyone else has you know a gig worth of data and expects everyone to pay equally for it? it it's I think we run into this. That's part of independence. You're gonna have to do some hard work with your neighbors. You might have to get good at saying, "Hey, dude, not cool." Like, <laughs> you do realize what you're doing. You realize the impact you're having on real people. I could kick you off the server, right? You have to, this, this is a skill. Someone said something about this earlier. This is a skill that needs to be developed. And it's not easy. And we're not well trained for it. But it's the alternative. And if you don't engage with developing that skill, I have so much I could say about this. But the short version is, <laughs> you don't engage with that skill, you have two options things the way they are that I don't like, just accepting the authority that's out there, or go out there and deal with some messy relationships and neighbors who might not have the virtues I'm hoping they have. And, and maybe have to look at the plank in my eye at the virtues I have that are incompatible with my neighbors. That's a, that's a tough road, but that's the road to independence. I don't really see it going any other way. You can move, get new neighbors. Uh -huh. You could cross your fingers and hope that there's a yeah. house <laughs> with all the right people living around you. <laughs> Roll the dice. If you find out, let me know. I'll move in next door. <laughs> well, this gets into like community dynamics and Thich Nhat Hanh stuff about like, you know, when it's appropriate to. Well, and then it gets into secession, which we're headed towards here. Like the ability for the individual to secede from the group and the ability for the group to secede from the individual. It's like. You know, if you can't, if there's a person in the group that is not possessed of the virtues and in fact is um, like working against the, the group, then, you know, you, you're in a pickle. So you have to resolve that. But Yeah, I wanted to chime in on the virtue piece and in this case, working in groups and moving out of a group and into another group. But uh, it was the Jordan Peterson one on what is truth or we could say what is virtue and that is whoever can defeat the chaos monster you know everyone files it behind him in the larger hierarchy the dominance hierarchy that's his that's his platform basically so what is good what is true what is virtue is uh it it feels like an end justifies the means piece whoever can subordinate chaos well, and to just dovetail really briefly on the Jordan Peterson front, you know, another uh, analogy that he brings up a lot of times is chimpanzee society. And he's like, you would think it was the most like vicious, like meanest, most brutal chimp that would just like lord over all the other chimps, but it's not. In fact, they they kill that chimp more more often than not. Like the rest of the troop will band together and. If some, if one chimp is trying to be a tyrant, they'll just they'll just band together and destroy it. It's the uh, it's the chimp that can communicate and can have social skills that allows it to collaborate and build relationships with other, and is also strong that ends up at the top of the the hierarchy. So there's a huge emphasis placed on the ability for the chimps to communicate and coordinate. That fits with what Mo said here. 
most, uh, I would say, prevailing virtues are those incentivized and elevated by the community, in this case, the chimpanzees. This was the, uh, this is why Dan initially said to uh, invite to Eden people who you would leave alone in your home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to mention, and maybe we should dovetail the virtual, virtual, virtue thing into the independence discussion that maybe we'll have later, but <laughs> is it possible to introduce game theory and de design a system or a construct that um, brings out sort of the best virtues in the people? Yeah, um, one, one other model, like so, so um, in designing this game theory piece that Josh has just spoken to, um, we have all these new tools with our new, you know, external, like our internet function, our, our mind, our new greater tools heading into the singularity. So the evolutionary slope is very steep right now, but to go to the chimpanzees and back to the wolves, the wolves with the, um, the way that the leader would throw the opponent on the ground and act like he was biting his neck and he'd, he'd pop off, let the opponent live. And then the opponent would fold into his, his hierarchy, his, his group. So that was an evolutionary pinpoint. Then the chimpanzees, as Brandon just described, have this function where they don't uh, sacrifice the soft. So, and so they bring the soft guy in and let him take a uh, leadership you know, so here we are looking at this book that's trying to apply these new, you know, excellent game theory tools. And uh, I think uh, our uh, any little efforts that we make, say, to reach out to our neighbor and to begin exercising dialogue, independence, like Mike said, a skill set of saying that's not good. Um, that is going to go a long way because <laughs> we're in a super large transitionary period right now where yeah so i would say you know it's good work and it's not going to be lost two uh two more things on that um to to go back to what's said here uh about the measure uh, oh uh i guess it, mark just said it and i guess it wasn't written the thing about uh who you would let be be in your house I have a friend who has a measure of, I think it's friends. I think he says uh, friends or people he has over uh, to visit. His requirement is that he's comfortable with them hugging his kids. And I thought, man, that wraps up so much good stuff in a wow. very simple metric, you mm. know? And it allows a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. But that's a clear line. If If you're not comfortable with that, you should say no, <laughs> you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Like that's, I just, I love these, these very concise kind of summation evaluations that are not, not straightforward to logically justify in, you know, in a, in a reductionist way. Um, but they're, they're super valuable. And Mark, since you came back to this point, I, I have to tell at least an abbreviated version of the story. When I moved to Chile, I went to Chile for certain kinds of freedom that I felt they didn't have here. And uh, I ran into, you know, I can, at a festival, I can buy a beer and walk a few blocks to the beach. And that's not a problem because an open can or whatever the hell we call it, it's just not a thing there. My friend looked at me like I was crazy. Like, oh yeah, of course you can buy a beer and walk to the beach. Why, why are you even asking? And I, I loved, I loved those freedoms, but then you know, the car with the massive speaker drives by advertising the water company <laughs> around the corner and you just, you can't get away from it. You have no privacy, you have no insulation and there's no code. There's no, you know, uh, sound noise code. I don't even know what you'd call that. Uh, disturbing the peace or whatever. Yeah. That code doesn't exist. And the municipal police is, is minuscule. So what do you do about that? And I had to, I had to deal with, and a neighbor issue I won't go into, but you know, what do I do? I've got a neighbor and I have really no one to complain to. I'm, I'm stuck with <laughs> go talk to the neighbor, <laughs> right? which, which is like this, the biggest duh answer. But I tell you, it took me a few weeks of, okay, so I'm a freedom minded person. 
I don't want an authority to fix this for me. What do I do about it? And that, that inquiry <laughs> took me two or three weeks to come to anything legitimate about what to do about it. But essentially it comes down to, yeah, you're gonna have to talk to him, knock on a door, deal with whatever you deal with, deal with the potential lack of virtue and build a relationship, build the virtues. And if you have to war a little bit, your smoke comes into my apartment, I will put something, I will make sure something gets in your apartment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that will not but end it, well. <laughs> <laughs> not for the other guy. <laughs> yeah, for I'm cre- I'm pretty creative. <laughs> but that's that's a skill set, you know, even knowing where that line is. I'm a rules follower. So without rules, I'm lost. I mean, I used to be a rules follower. Without rules, I was completely lost. And when I have to develop my own rules, like, well, where's the limit? How if you're going to if you get someone who's ready to war, how do you deal with that and not just inflame a massive war? Like these are all things that you've got to grapple with when you engage this and none of it's easy. Yeah. We don't even have basic protocols like dueling anymore. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I challenge you to a duel. Uh, That's awesome. Okay. Uh, Moving on. Uh, If you are in the minority, then the idea of unrestricted democratic power, whether direct or indirect, could be a threat. This means that those with minority opinions argue for rights and limits on government power. I found that to be interesting. Well, and I think it comes up here in a moment, if it hasn't already, the individual is the smallest minority, so you are a minority. Mm-hmm. That is mentioned somewhere. Must come up later. I highlight a lot of this. Uh, shall I read? This end justifies the means philosophy is the seed of genocide and totalitarian utopianism. <laughs> That's another one of those zingers that could go on, go on a t-shirt. It's a really fat, heavy statement, but history proves this out. Like understanding that is critical. People who study philosophy deeply and, and practical, practically apply it are really, really, really clear that the ends cannot justify the means, that never works. But until you get that, yeah, that leads to genocide. Like that's a that's a huge deal. Those are dots that are hard to connect. Some of my edits in this book were like, Dan, this is a big leap. Like, <laughs> you might have to walk people through this because I don't think we relate to that as a as an easy as easy dots to connect. But right, we don't. Yeah, we're on uh, the end. The means justify the end now. Yeah, it's 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 hard. It's hard to uh, to, but it needs to be done. And yeah, it's a it's teleology. Yeah, that's the study. Teleology. Yeah, and I, I put that in the uh, the private chat is in the in the notes. Te- teleology, the philosophy of that, and yeah, justify cool. the means. Yeah, teleological <laughs> arguments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mike, I saw a message from you that you were wondering about the link to the OneNote mm-hmm. that we're taking notes in. Yeah. Did you want? Did you get that? Do you want that? Uh, sure. Send it to me. I don't. Um, I I can provide that after. Yeah. Or and Chris, is the, can is you the drop, private drop it in the Drop it in the private chat, Chris. I can attempt that. Uh, let me. You can, you can do it. Yeah, I'll have to un, un let me unshare my screen then. Oh, it's is just that in the private chat sheet? a good place for me to be putting the notes in? The private chat shouldn't show up on screen anywhere. That's the definition. No, of no, no, no. Chat. But for me to then get the link, I'd have to show my screen. Oh, like I see. I see. I see. So if you want, if you guys. Want well, it's nice to see everybody for a second, anyway. Hi. You uh, you have this, Mark. Mark, you've got access to this. It's the one note that you've been putting uh, all the video links in. If you a different tab there is called. Uh, <clears throat> I was asking for Mike. Not yeah, Mark. yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get it for if Mike. it's if it's any kind of pain in the ass, it's it's not priority. We can do it offline. Well, uh, I'll go to OneNote a... and uh, paste everything that I've put in the private chat in there, and I can put other notes in there. Yeah, the private chat's transitory. That's the only concern there. So anything you want to last, we should put elsewhere. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I'm... everyone is in the Slack besides you, Mike, I think. Um, oh. But you were 
You're invited. Oh, that's right. You're Slug. just not. I know, yeah. right? Wait, wait, hold on. Let me uh, let me shut down one of my chat clients so I have enough memory to open another chat client. <laughs> Okay, Mike, uh, it's in the uh, private chat there, the link to Great. this one note. And then um, you just Thanks, have to go Chris. to your, your view will be different, <clears throat> but you'll you'll see some tabs on the far left. You just want to go to becoming MEA and we're on day two. Great. I thought the forced multiplication of multiple note takers would be worth the short delay and procedure here. That's right. um, so where were we? Where were we? The, uh, the, this ends justifies the means philosophy is the seat of genocide and totalitarian utopianism. We've mentioned that. This means, uh, sorry, the means must justify themselves and be consistent with truth and integrity of the community consensus. Um, dislike of the outcome is not in itself an argument against the means. Which I find that's super interesting like when you consider the most recent election and previous elections for example when there's always this talk of oh it was rigged there's tampering right so that means the outcome you don't like the outcome and you don't like the means apparently too but they are not the same yeah this this is uh, this is another one i i tripped over as a, a really valuable way to to um communicate this to people i i whoever i'm talking to like whatever team they they root for i say okay you get your ideal candidate you get you know freedom you get a a, a the congress and senate and the supreme court on the same side everybody's playing for the same team you can pass whatever you want you can put more power and more funding and more budget and set everything up exactly the way you want you get everything you want and then four or eight years later the team switches and now you have more power and more money tied to seats not people tied to seats not not policies and now you're going to put the other team in the at the helm of that extra money and power what do you think of that and it people hate that idea of course because the means weren't being considered the ends were the most important thing and I got my ends, but the means that I had to set up to get them, now I'm handing all that over to the enemy. Yeah, there is no end. There is only the means. So the means better justify themselves. Well, that was almost a Ghostbusters quote. I love that, Chris. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, that was the strongest <laughs> quote for me. There just, there is no end. I yeah. I think we're a very goal oriented society. And to me, goals are synonymous with an end. So I think that uh, goals are bad. Yeah. <laughs> to have an end assumes <laughs> to have an end assumes that no additional laws or changes are needed. An end implies denying others the path to power. It implies an end to democracy. I tend to put ends in the category of like aspirations or aims rather than like a final state that I'm reaching for. It's like, I want to be in this kind of relationship in this, you know, way with, you know, it's like not, I'm not ever trying to like define like a fixed state outcome so much as like, you know, I think <clears throat> you can't totally like demonize goals per se, but but they're, um, they, it's like, it's this age old problem of confusing the market with the game. You know, it's like, it's like money. We use money to, to transact, but then people end up wanting the money. They just want money. It's like, well, what do you want the money for? You know, it's like, they've forgotten That's what they want it for. They just want the money. You know, it's like, just yeah. people get confused about that. So here's another bit. Uh, society is an emergent property of individuals, and the two must live in a symbiotic relationship because individuals depend on upon society, and society is comprised of individuals. The challenge of government is that it is supposed to be operated by individuals for the benefit of society, but individuals are easily corrupted by the ability to use the power of society uh, that the power of society grants them for personal gain. 
I, I highlighted this one too, and it's worth mentioning that symbiotic would be synonymous with mutually beneficial, a mutually beneficial relationship, um, which again kind of hints at what interdependence really is. Um, it's a social contract, basically. And, it, and all social contracts, if they're equitable, they should be mutually beneficial. And we, <clears throat> we probably should have a system where we don't allow uh, contracts that aren't mutually beneficial. <laughs> As like a rule of uh, thumb. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you agree to it. Really had a, well, even if you uh, even if someone consents or agrees to it, um, it's not going to work out well for the every party involved. Um, on, on some level, like even even in a friendship, if a, if a friend is not really being a true friend and carrying their weight in the friendship, um, it you like uh, I think biologically, there's things that happen. Um, when you have when you have those kind of dynamics going on in your life in terms of like net networking and stuff like that it's a it's a lowest common denominator kind of factor where you're allowing someone else to uh, not carry their own weight and and one way or another I think you end up getting punished for it like yeah. I think Mike you kind of spoke to that earlier like having the skill or the ability to speak up that's you know, like, hey, this isn't this isn't going to pan out well. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Symbiote. And I just wanted to point out, and this is kind of splitting hairs um, semantically, but from a physical sciences standpoint, like it has been pointed out to me before when I was using the word symbiotic that parasitism is actually a form of symbiosis. So there's three forms of symbiosis. I just had to re remind myself, just FYI. One is mutualism where both um, species benefit. And then another form of, um, well, and there's other like gradations of mutualism, but then- um, Both then species pa benefit. Paras yeah, parasitism is actually a symbiotic relationship, but where one party benefits at the expense of the other. And then commensalism is the third form of symbiotic relationships where one benefits and the other is unaffected. Um, so just FYI that, but you know, like if you look at the dictionary definition, it tends to say that, you know, it tends to take a more flattering view of symbiosis, but if you're talking to a biologist, they will correct you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's worth mentioning that because the, the, there's like a biomimicry component to how things are explained in this book. And that's where like fractal governance comes from. There's a fractal nature to the reality that we live in. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's all I wanted to add. All right. The next that I have highlighted here, uh, a government that allows secession without war is a government that allow that has the people's willing consent and serves all the people. Anyone who wasn't served, could secede. Okay. Let's should we that, plug? We? Uh, should we plug those art, those declarations of concession again? I'm definitely going to read read all 13 of those. That, or that's how I think many we I found when you were talking. Doesn't about the book get more deeply? I forget where the, what chapter that is. Isn't there like a whole section on secession? Yes, it, it comes up a lot. So let's put that aside for now because. I can't remember where good, that is, but good good comment from Mo. Uh, is it on screen? Money is supposedly uh, money supposedly equals independence equals freedom. Mm. Except for more money, more problems. <laughs> <laughs> we are gonna make a rap song. Yeah, you just, just wait. Broke at a higher level. <laughs> uh. I don't know if anybody else, anybody have anything highlighted here before I move on to the next one um, here? I mean, it's interesting, the wise benevolent dictatorship run by a philosopher king. It's all great until he dies. Someone else takes his place. Especially since we're in that situation right now, but at least there are some provisions in place. Um, 
Yeah, you had societies and emergency emergent property of individuals, right? And then and then the only thing I highlighted on page 30 besides that is it is not enough for the government to serve some, it must serve all. Um and then the the part that follows that I have in brackets, the test to determine whether a government is serving all members cannot be based upon specific outcomes, but based upon the means by which those outcomes are achieved, more specifically a government that allows secession with, oh, you already read this. Yeah, without war is a government yeah. that has people's willing consent and serves all the people. Anyway, sorry, I'm not paying attention. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing like just the questions plucked out of the book in a list. Some excellent questions. Yeah, for real. I'm not highlighting all those. Uh, no, I'm just going to do a control F of question marks and go through <clears throat> one day and I'm just, just pull every it. question out. Yeah. That'll be like um, so a few hours. <laughs> judging a democratic process based upon the people it might empower today is like judging a benevolent dictatorship based upon the person who would become king today. Yeah, short-sighted expediency, absolutely. Okay. I will move on if no one comes in. I don't I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole, but um what do you th I'm I'm going to I'm going to throw a bomb out there. We can move on if you guys don't want to talk about <laughs> it, but when I when I was uh, re reabsorbing this section of the book about the philosopher king, I was kind of thinking a little bit about the what's happening with the EOS Foundation and Dan's endorsement of that. Yeah. Um, which overall I feel really good about, but it, it, I just couldn't help but notice that there was a little bit of that dynamic there. And Dan did point some of that stuff out in his interview and in his articles about even using the term philosopher uh, philosopher king, I believe. Mm -hmm. Did you guys notice yeah, exactly. some kind exactly. of a similar correlation there? Definitely. That's what I was referring to yeah. when I said we're already in this kind of situation. Um, yeah, well, it gets tricky. But I, but I think that uh, as I think he's trying to implement a system that could come in once this philosopher king, quote unquote, dies or leaves. Um, but I think he's realized that to jumpstart, to get the rocket in the air, we need something like this. Mm -hmm. I think also that it's uh, a very good um, state that we're in, that we're discussing that and we're aware of that. And yeah. we can uh, take action uh, sooner than, than just wait and, and be passive about it and, and uh, write books about it uh, after it's it's gone down, you know, downhill. Yeah, well, and the fact that there's a, he put a, a term limit on being the, what originally was called the interim Satoshi, um, mm -hmm. and has explicitly said, part of the reason we put sortition in the, in the last round is so that someone couldn't win like him. It wouldn't guarantee him a seat. And I think that's, that's how this needs to be designed. And I, I guess the other thing that comes to mind for whatever it's worth is how many people could achieve what we are, what I, I what has already been achieved, but also what, what looks like will be achieved aside from Elon Musk, right? Like that, there's just something magic about that dude. So at some point, maybe we'll have rocket point to point travel in a half hour anywhere on earth and that'll be commonplace and that'll be an industry and there'll be numerous competitors just like the airline industry but how would that have happened or how long would that have taken if it weren't for that one human being that one mind i think i think this is a similar situation where this is revolutionary this is extremely innovative and None of us wrote this book. <laughs> and there's a lot of smart people out there writing lots of books and no one's begun an experiment like Eden on EOS until now. So yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of bootstrapping and it's really, as Ami said, it's really, really cool that we're already in the conversation of, yeah, how do we, how do we get obsolete Dan? <laughs> That's way overstated, but right. How do we, how do we have this thing be independent how do we have this thing get its own legs for sure eventually exactly 
would would you credit some of that phenomenon to first principles thinking and thought process yeah absolutely um when you look at what dan has studied what are the bodies of knowledge that he has acquired and then you mix it with what i am have to imagine is just raw intelligence the ability to extrapolate and make associations and mental leaps um there's there's numerous factors right what makes elon musk uh so effective one of his things is where where apparently kind of like sociology where most of us get lulled into doing things a particular way his brain's on all the time of hey that's dumb the way we're doing that why did you do that we need to we need to innovate this and we just keep staying in boxes and falling in mental holes and his brain's just always on catching that and saying that's not getting us where we want to go i want to move faster i want to be more effective there's 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 numerous like mental things that people have demonstrated uh knowledge intelligence and stuff like that that are not easily categorizable uh that make extreme innovation like that possible endless supplies of money also help just to throw that i want to i want to yeah, rabbit hole us right i want to rabbit hole us a little further before bring us back on track if i can um i recently read an article by charles eisenstein who's one of my favorite authors and thinkers and it was about elon it started out about about elon musk and i'm just going to read the beginning of it to you because it's so relevant to what we're talking about right now he says in a conversation with a friend yesterday the question arose what are we to expect to happen in the next decade elon musk had come up earlier in the conversation and i said you know if we asked elon musk that question he might take it very differently his answer might start with i'll tell you what's going to happen and then describe what he intends to make of the world. Maybe he would say, there will be 12,000 low orbit satellites circling the earth. You'll be able to get broadband internet in the Alaskan wilderness. We'll all be linked together in an internet of things. A kind of fatalism haunts predictions about the future as if it were an objective pre-existing reality that simply happens to us. Tell me, tell me what is to be so that I may plan my life accordingly. Elon Musk's answer takes the question in a different way by assuming his own power and agency in determining what the future will be. He is speaking from a metaphysical truth that self and world, inner and outer, are not entirely separate, and that the question of what the future will be intimately involves ourselves. Um, one might, I'll just one more chapter, one more paragraph. One might easily agree that we can shape the future as a collective ourselves, but my hypothetical Elon Musk takes it about himself. Why does he think that? Makes it about himself. Why does he think that? Is it only because he has vast wealth? Lots of extraordinarily wealthy people feel helpless in the face of the future, and their attempts to create it end in failure. The power he wields is what I call prophetic speech. Prophetic speech is the ability to speak a potentiality into reality. It also includes the prophetic warning, which speaks of potentiality out of reality. Anyway, it's a really good article. It's called How It's Going to Be. And it fits. And Dan, yeah, it makes, I... It makes a lot of Dan sense this. to me. I wonder if yeah. some of this stuff also wraps into virtue. Um, mm. Yeah. I think uh, going back to uh, Joshua's bomb... Uh, the, the pressing issue with Eden on EOS is to become independent and not reliant on uh, infusion of money from the foundation. And I think that's going to solve this uh, dilemma. Well said, Ami. Mm -hmm. All right, back on track. Thank you. Mr. The big green blob here that I've highlighted, I think this is uh, an interesting one even though it's a, something we've all kind of heard before. Since the legitimate power of democracy is derived from the consent of the people to the process of democracy, the minority necessarily retrains the right to secede and become independent. It is the right of independence that prevents the majority from devouring the minority. The ultimate minority is the individual, as you mentioned earlier, Josh. It has been said that democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to eat for dinner. The lamb might consent to the process if and only if lamb chops are not on the menu. The day the wolves vote to eat lamb chops um, 
the, the, the lamb has the right to secede and is not bound by democratic virtue to offer its neck. The animals return to the law of the jungle. The lamb may still be eaten, but democratic legitimacy has nothing to do with it. This is not to say that the sheep wouldn't consent to give up some wool or milk in exchange for the wolf's contribution to security. The key is that there is a voluntary trade and a voluntary agreement to the system of compromise. This is another good section for uh, illustration in a um, documentary, like vis-a-vis -vis animation or however. I also think analogies like this are similarly uh, to whatever the last thing I, I pointed out in the book was. They're they're similar. They're similarly easy to dismiss. Uh, I guess we were talking about uh, genocide last time, so it's kind of in a sense the opposite <laughs> end of the spectrum, but. This one on the opposite end is is trivial. It's a it's a fairy tale ish. It's you know mm -hmm. talking high functioning civil animals. Like it's very easy to take it like a fable and just be like, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Of course, you know the things that eat the thing shouldn't have. Uh, of course. But while that's in a course, man, this is this is how it is. And then we use these crazy <clears throat> crazy justifications that, well, you should consent to this. Well, wait, what? <laughs> like, it is like this. This is how it yeah. is. And what, the other thing I love in, that's built into this, this quotable here is that I tell people all the time, we have to remember in blockchain that we're not going for perfect. Everybody wants like, well, what about privacy? Uh, what about encryption? What about, what about, what about? We're not aiming for the perfect system. We're just aiming for something better. Anything we can produce that's better than what's out there is interesting. Um, you know, yeah. Elon Musk is not lamenting that he can't develop teleportation. I'm sure he's working on it, but I'm sure he's also not lamenting it. Point to point and a half hour on the planet is is pretty awesome. Uh, and I think this this gets at that the the lamb may still be eaten. We're we're not saying that we have the perfect solution, <clears throat> but it's a better solution. It's a more legitimate solution. Well. At this point, so to me, the analogy here about the lamb and, and the wolf is like, okay, so the, how is power defined between these two entities, right? So lamb and wolf, power is defined by basically the wolf has sharper teeth, it's faster, it's stronger, it can devour the lamb. So it's power is physical prowess. But in human-to-human -human interaction, how is power defined between us? Well, money, influence. So we there are sheep and lamb, or sorry, sheep and wolves in modern society amongst humans. The wolves are the ones who have the power. And the sheep or the rest of us who are just basically, you know, tending to the fields and doing what we're told. And uh, it, it, we, we need to, the idea that we can secede and are we, the law of the jungle in the human context is basically those who have more power, AKA more money. Uh, do we have a voluntary system between those who don't have? Like are, are we're, it's, it seems like it's a good relating it to, to money and power as opposed to just physical prowess. Not not to stretch the analogy too much, but can the sheep decide to become a wolf? <laughs> no. <laughs> a, sheep, a sheep can't manifest teeth. It can't manifest. No, just like I you can't can manifest be, more money. You can be whatever you want to be, Josh. It's don't, <laughs> I don't listen to these guys. <laughs> if you want to get augmented teeth in your mouth and you want to like run with it, I won't judge you. You can be anybody. <laughs> I think Gary Larson... Uh, from the far side can make yeah. a, a, a one picture like cartoon of the whole uh, situation with before yeah. after and present in, in one picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So joking, joking aside, I, I think that um, a sheep or anything can be anything you want mentally, um, but not physically. So a sheep can be a wolf mentally, but not physically. Yeah, yeah which, kind of, but, which doesn't kind of, do any good for any. Doesn't do. I mean, great, good, good luck, sheep. You think you're you think you're a wolf. You're still get chomped up to bits. <laughs> I was so, kind of poking fun and like throwing throwing it back to that article that Lovejoy read about, oh, about yeah. Elon about like because <clears throat> like well, if they, humans if humans decide something you know w with the power of our brains being receivers and transmitters of vibration and stuff um, you can you can affect physical reality with that ability. Um, Mo dropping truth bombs on us. 
Yes. When the sheep so becomes the wolf, the wolf becomes the sheep. There will always be a sheep and a wolf. Hmm. Damn. Escaping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think okay. that's the point that Dan brings up earlier, where the human disposition is to have leaders and followers. We're always going to fall back into that. Yeah. I'm well, there's always going to be power, power differential. It's possible with the game theory to change that reality somehow. Well, there's always, you know, back to Pareto principle, there's always going to be like more talented, stronger people in our midst. You know, the goal isn't to like handicap them like Harris and Bergeron and like make them like put headphones on that like interrupt their thought process so that they're like just as dumb as the rest of us. The The goal is to find a way to coexist with each other um, despite our power differentials and, and you know, you use those to our advantage as a collective rather than um, either devolving into the tyranny of the more powerful and more intelligent versus the the sheep among us. Um, but yeah, the agreement, the consent, you know. And I will say that the sheep can become a wolf, Josh. They just have to band together in a sufficient number to fight the wolves. But, <clears throat> you know, then, then back to Nuno or Mo, what Mo says, you know, it's like the eternal cycle. You know, guys, after reading the book several times, I watched the uh, film um, <laughs> yeah. and it's it, it has some images, very strong images. You see the pigs at the early stages of uh, the social structure evolving and they took some puppies and they grew them up and they became their uh, wolves you know, to control mm -hmm. the rest of the animals. So it's it's interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. However, the mob ultimately runs society. Keep that in mind. And individual property rights mean nothing in a riot. And here, a libertarian, socialist, anarchist, or Marxist utopia is the result of changing public opinion and maintaining public support. If you don't change opinions or alternatively commit genocide, then the utopia cannot last. Yeah. And that Can last you click thing highlight is, something any society, from page? Any society which cannot tolerate differences of opinion is fragile mm. and unsustainable. Yeah, I have that too. Okay, top of page 32. Oh, that's down here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you want me to go back and highlight something, Brennan? Well, I thought, like, after all our banter, I didn't know if we underlined the conclusion of the wolf and sheep thing that Dan himself had written. Um, which I don't know if it's underlined. Um, the key. Where does it say? This is not to uh, say yeah, that sheep. The key land. is that. Yeah. The key is that there is a voluntary trade, and voluntary agreement to a system of compromise. And then the first Going sentence, back to the, the next one, systemic issues. Okay. And then I thought the principle of democracy is that the people should be in control. Um, the rest of it, whatever. But like, I just thought that's another affirmative statement about what Dan considers the, like if the people aren't in control, then it's not democracy. Carry on, next page. Yep. Next page, uh, okay, here I have highlighted each and every day, people make decisions based upon what they think other people think. Style, language, morals, religion, politics, and just about everything you can think of are heavily influenced by what we think other people's opinions are. If we think other people, what we think other people think is vastly different than what they really think. What we tell other people is often what we think they want to hear instead of what we really think. When in doubt, most people defer to what they believe is public opinion over their own opinion, and most people are often in doubt. This deferral to public opinion is also why most people yield to the democratic process. I find that interesting mm -hmm. in many ways. Do we all agree with that? Do you agree that most people are hollow shells reflecting and mirroring society? <laughs> 
Well, you know, directing your attention to page 33, when he, he talks about the Solomon Ash experiment, the conformity experiment, yes, I would say yes. Like it's been very well demonstrated. You can get people to agree with things that they know that they don't agree with as long as everyone else in the room is, is saying that that's true. And everyone wants to say that they don't fit into that category until they're in the experiment and then they find out you know, nine times out of 10 that they actually do fall for it. So I'm afraid it's just human psychology. Seven Where times we, out of 10. Seven times out of 10. Yeah. We like to, we like to fit in, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable to stand out and to be apart from the crowd. Um, I, I underlined the uh, other part on 32 <clears throat> where he says, if you can control the major media outlets, and continuously show support of a minority opinion over the real majority opinion, then people will come to believe that the minority opinion is the majority opinion. Yeah, you got that yeah. already. Are you doing it now? It's, yeah, no, I had it too. I'm with you on that I, one. So I, summed all this up as, yeah, I just summed all this up as polling is gamed. <laughs> right. Like, which is to say we don't know our own opinions as a society because it's being fed to us through a corrupt process. The conformity experiment comes up, is it later? Yeah, right here, 75%, sorry, 7.5%. Mm -hmm. um, conformity experiment, yep. exactly, the vision test. So people don't know, vision tests, people in a room, there's a bunch of paid people who are there basically who will say the wrong answer, obviously wrong answer about length of lines. And 75% of the time people will concede to what the group thinks. So this, I've asked this question of these people before about conformity and is it something that can be taught or is it just something we're instinctively, I think Mike, you had, you had said it can be taught. I'm not sure how you teach it. And, and this kind of, this is this whole point of if people are willing to just, just say or do whatever they think the modern, the current popular opinion is, how do you change that? Like, is this part of the, indoctrination slash inculcation camps and they're teaching us to just conform to groupthink. I don't know if I remember correctly, but Mike, didn't you bring up the uh, homeschool thing last time? I think you got to get people early for this one because it's like it's a faculty you either develop pretty young or you don't, I think. Well, uh, that's better right? Uh, don't mess people up to begin with is a better approach than messing them up and trying to fix them. <laughs> uh, but uh, that aside, you know, I've, I've been a personal coach for many, many, many years. And man, it's super inspiring and totally works to see a, I saw a 102 year old woman who just started, like, learned the right tools and sorted herself out and started living an awesome life where she wasn't before. So uh, a lot of this stuff can certainly be uh, deprogrammed. And I think people have to see the opportunity in it, right? I think a, a big, big part of what we're doing in the Eden community is is shining, shining lights, not the right analogy, but we're, we're demonstrating something. People are gonna be able to look at how Eden on EOS is functioning. And they're going to see, oh, that's what awesome uh, coordination looks like among humans who want to coordinate, right? And I think that that beacon, that that demonstration goes a long way to at least we now know, oh, yeah, I want that. As soon as you can get somebody saying, I want that, we can sort out the rest. But it's it's very hard when there is no, is no example. How far did I diverge from that question? <laughs> did I do well? <laughs> Okay. Well, to me, it's like, so how, how did you, you mention the example of the 102 year old woman? So the, I guess that's, we need to, we need, is there a system on how do we deprogram conformity? Is, is this like a, a, a five, seven step system we need to <clears throat> develop and push the It's a the human world? development thing, you know? Um, I think if, if we go back to first principles again, like what Dan's really hinting at here, the underlying issue is the mentality of of humanity or civilization to this point has been like our guidance system has been external authorities telling us what to do how to live how to spend 
our money, how to run our businesses and stuff like that. And people have allowed that to happen. But uh, evolution seems to be taking us out of that where we're shifting to eventually we'll have a dominant mentality of using our internal authority and self-leadership, self-correcting, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so every, if, if every structure of civilization is based on our mentality, then every structure has to change. So our current political structure has been a ruling class. And the, the new structure is going to have to be something else. And the current structure won't survive the evolution, which is almost something to be very optimistic about. Um, that, 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 I don't know. That assumes that evolution goes in a certain direction. And it just sort of happens. The current, those who are in control will prevent that as pointed out by the malleability of the human mind and spirit. Like right now, this conformity bias, I think is something that's taught. I don't, I don't I think this is pushed to us and here we are sheep and lamb story. So there's going to be tough to break that direction. Yeah, I think, I think it happens from survival pressures. It might be worth taking a look at uh, Julian Jane's uh, work on scientific research on the bicameral mentality. Um, and it seems like we've been living in like a mutated version of that for quite a while, but it looks like we're starting to come out of it. Uh, people's actions <clears throat> are shaped by what they believe public opinion is. One way to demoralize the silent majority is to make them believe they are the minority. That yeah, I had the same thing underlined. It always makes me think of the classic. Um, it's a little different. It's very different, actually. But it may, still makes me think of like the way you train an elephant. You know, where How do you, train you, an you shackle like a young elephant with like pretty substantial chains around one leg. And it just gets completely hopeless that it can never break free. But then by the time it's an old elephant, you just have like a shackle with like a teeny little chain or rope on it that the elephant could easily break, but it's just convinced that it can't. And so it never tries. And so you can, you can mm -hmm. keep a giant elephant on a, a totally insignificant leash that will never break. Um, and it's, this is kind of this. Society. Yeah. This is kind of like <clears throat> the, that psychological version of that. It's like, you know, teach people, their whole life that their minority opinion even though in reality per perhaps many people share those beliefs but they'll never know that and they'll always believe themselves to be minority so they'll never act on their beliefs um fearing that they'll be you know outcast essentially mm -hmm. you, you couple that with the boiling frog slash mission creep effect of the way things are going, right? It's like we look back two years ago, and if we were to describe the current reality to people, they would like, "What are you smoking, you crazy conspiracy theorist?" And now, oh, gradually, right. gradually, two weeks to flatten the curve is now two years to I don't even know what the goal is anymore. And it just goes yep. to show that people, yeah, we, we collectively suck. <laughs> the Overton uh, window, I keep saying, the Overton window is is broken. Like the window itself is broken. The whole idea that <laughs> you can shift public opinion like only so far at a go well here we go and this is the perfect 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 next spot to highlight and read then after i just said people suck facilitating truthful perception of public opinion is the first step towards a peaceful revolution and to me that just screamed clarion amen yep i have that highlighted too I think I also have, out. yeah. And following up on that, the next thing I have highlighted, I don't know if anyone else has anything highlighted between these two points, but I just highlighted, if precautions are not taken, those skilled in propaganda can manipulate a democratic society to serve their personal agenda. And then I underlined Pied Piper because there's another good visual... Um, Where's the precaution? You know. what am I um, I halfway down the paragraph beginning with one way or another, or almost a, the last sentence okay. of that is, oh, if okay, precautions yeah. are not taken. Yeah. 
I see. Yeah. It. Oh, and you have. I had highlighted. I highlighted before. That it is not so easy when most people are rationally ignorant on most things and therefore have opinions that they falsely believe are their own. In reality, their opinions are just the aggregation of what they falsely believe everyone around them believes. That is total like mind a fuck. ego busting thing to accept. Mm -hmm. so what are you talking about? I've I've done all sorts of research. I know all sorts of shit. And it's like, no, nah, you don't. You're just a parrot. We all are accepted. <laughs> Not to be too gloomy. <laughs> I guess hey, I if we can go. I'll if we can train thank you so much for your time today. Oh yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. We'll we'll try not to like just drag the rest of this out too long. We're almost done. Kind of. We're almost done. This is uh yeah. This is there was a lot here though, and we've gone been awesome. So we're almost we're learning done. what our limits are. Uh, have a good one. Later. Um <clears throat> cool. Democracy hey, and the rule of law. Or anyone else? Can I say, can I say one thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this this uh, growth curve for this uh, this is session number two. Uh, uh, this conversation is great, and the format is coming together very nicely. And I really appreciate that, whether it's led by Brandon or Chris or you guys teaming it together and that sort of thing. But uh, on the subject last of the kind of gloomy tendency, that's okay. But um, I do I do feel there's a model here for just. As soon as you begin to reorient, man, the kind of goodness and excitement and all the pieces coming together, all the necessary uh, facility is inspiring. It, it's a, almost, uh, there's another, there's more words to describe that uh, basic excellence. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it, it fundamentally, I don't believe is, is, is particularly gloomy if anything it's it's totally the opposite it's bright and it's awesome uh, and and if you're and and we were all brought up a half an hour ago hour ago we were kind of born into this <laughs> where we had a lot of compromise we're doing the best we can we're on some kind of you know obvious evolutionary curve and uh, and to see us you know turn to and kind of these little micro discoveries and especially on such a profound level uh move forward in the uh Fun, Prince first principle sense of moving forward, whatever that may be personally to you, is uh, is massive. So yeah, I just want to plug that since there is often a time to descend into the it, shit. This stuff is so disorganized. Well, you know, maybe the uh, to navigate to to engage with chaos or navigate chaos on a principle level. Uh, yeah, uh, in and of itself, the means justify the means kind of thing. So. Okay, just wanted to like say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Well, and <clears throat> just really quickly footnote on that is that I, you know, the, the first part of this book focuses on a lot of the problems. So, you know, before he, he, he's trying to identify what the problems we're facing are before he gets into the solutions, you know? And, um, and so it's easy to get kind of depressing and um, just, yeah, because I mean, a lot of the beginning of this part focuses on how the system is gamed and how people are taken advantage of and what the, you know, all that stuff. So it is just kind of sad to read, but um, that's the state of affairs. And and the, the rest of the book is pretty, uh, more problems identified, but a lot of solutions revealed. So we have that to look forward to. Yeah, thanks for that. You're right. It, it can be true. It can be kind of grotesque. <laughs> okay, talking um, about the rule of law here, uh, it moves kind of moving, if you believe in the rule of law, uh, the entirety of the law should be the process by which rules are made and disputes resolved. Rule of law then becomes a matter of enforcing that process. I like that summation. Mm hmm. It's highlighted by here. Looks like I found a spot I didn't highlight everything. The only thing I have highlighted on this entire page is 
and maybe I could have highlighted a little bit more leading up to this, but the solution to this failure is to return to the rule of law by holding an election. If the people can agree on this very simple principle, then civil war can be avoided and power can be passed from term to term peacefully. It's like, you know, I think he's just hitting that same point again. It's like, well, we need consensus. How are we going to get that? Well, we need to hold a new election to agree on what the consensus is. Um, you know? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Law. Process is primary. Okay. Guess I'll move on here. Few more pages. Uh, I've got this part here. A true democracy must be rely must reliably represent the consensus of the majority of people by implementing a process that is robust against factionalism and the corruption of its own process. Speaking to the previously mentioned systematic issues, aren't <clears throat> they're not it's not necessarily people issues. It's a system issue. Yeah, I would I'd go back to the the whole first part of that paragraph too, or at least um, that that a dino is just a covert minority rule. So I think that's a good, oh yeah. That's a good thing for people to like meditate on. It's like, well, you don't really have a democracy. You have a covert minority rule that you're calling a democracy. True that, especially with, yeah, 30% <laughs> wins type thing. Okay, anything else people have? I've got uh, next, I've got, uh, in theory, a truly democratic process would be able to correct any man-made rule. Um, and this is definitely oh. right here. And it's definitely like, you, if I find a lot of these sort of points when we get into mm -hmm. the process that is like sort of the solution, because this whole book boils us into a solution. Um, this is I have another process. Yeah, go ahead. Right above that, um, I have another pro proscriptive sort of thing. It says the rule of law must live in the heart of the people. It must be simple to describe. It should be trivial to identify when the democratic process has been violated. Most importantly, the solution to a violation of the law should be a return to the law which the masses can trivially verify by hosting a new election and selection of new leaders. That seems like a major design uh, feature of Eden. Yeah, trivially, trivially verifiable. Yeah, and then, you know, but he, the, the beginning of the rule of law must live in the heart of the people is a, another, another nod back to that point he made really early on in this chapter, which is that, you know, even the best form of government is at the mercy of the prevailing virtues of the people being governed. You know, consent is key. So. Anything else? Anyone else? Democracy? Yeah, maybe toss in uh, a requisite kind of homework on the back end would be the nonviolent communication three hour seminar that. Dan Larimer published about like three or four years ago or something. So yeah, that's uh, at the heart of the people. It, it, that speaks to the, at the heart of the people because the language is embedded, the kind of properties of the heart of the people. So like Mike said, you reach out locally to the neighbor. Well, how? Well, you, you want to consider nonviolent communication <laughs> and I know it sounds like simple but just I've, I've been get, finally getting getting to it and it's it's necessary it's very it's helpful but yeah you're going to need to like basically be able to speak to the heart of the people which is not in the polarized uh, languages that have been established for many mm -hmm. millennia millennia so it's not too hard actually to uh, it, it's uh, tricky to change language but it can be done so um, that uh, that will that will be a key role. Yeah, you bring me back to the reminder that to keep an eye out for related texts or supporting materials to this work, um, including the one that Dan directly referenced, but he also in other places does call out NVC as kind of a foundational 
piece. So that's worth bundling together in a list of useful reading materials. So here we've got uh, direct, direct democracy. And I found this, how to describe rationally, rational ignorance. What does that mean? And this is, I found a good one. Most people are rationally ignorant because the value of investing time to understand all of the proposed laws is incredibly small relative to their ability to influence the outcome. It's just not worth the trouble to understand everything going into an election and party platforms and all that garbage because you, you realize you're not going to really affect anything anyway <laughs> with your one right. vote. So why bother? Exactly. Right. There's got to be a, a reward for people to do things, anything. And if the reward's not big enough, they're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah it's not, and like it's the, the opposite of the reward is feeling totally like powerless to do like that you don't, nothing you do matters at all. So why bother? It's like, you might as well play a video game on your phone. Yeah. At least then you get like a so little it, serotonin hit. In, in this bit, I could have highlighted more, but I tried to be concise. Building a society on top of a fragile technological base sets it up for failure in a worst case disruption. He does mention solar flare EMP computer system stuff. If the, if the Amish the Amish cannot implement the process and it is probably isn't truly democratic. This is too dependent upon technology. That's a really good one. I didn't highlight. All right. No one else has anything. I will scroll on. Uh, direct democracy does not build consensus. Keep that in mind next time somebody wants to tell you that Direct democracy is the answer. Yeah, that's interesting. And then yeah. you, uh, the point of 51% of the population can pass a law at the expense of 49%, mm -hmm. which is a problem. The, the lack of a scalable consensus building process is the final nail in the coffin of direct democracy. Just yeah. further highlighting what you already highlighted, basically. Yeah. True that democracy, me, right? however. But that threw me for a loop there. The direct democracy, can someone just summarize the problem? I mean, I can see it's a it does not build consensus, but uh, what's it's, the, I guess, subtle differences between direct democracy and true democracy, I guess, is where I'm. Well, uh, direct democracy. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. Ami. I think direct democracy is when you uh, uh, have a, a, a one question and you ask all the population of the country what's their opinion. Are they for or against something? So it's it's something yeah. outside it of the, the, con the concept. four year uh, cycle of uh, choosing your leaders. It's Thank going you. directly to the people, asking them something. You get you usually get something about uh, fifty one and forty nine and. Uh, the 49 people have to just uh, agree to the other's uh, answer. Yeah. Yeah, he says it here. The right. concept the of direct democracy is that the people should not have to rely upon representatives. All laws should be voted on directly by the people. So that's direct. It's like Brexit. They just had a poll of all the uh, citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand. I, I think I understand much better. Thank you. Meanwhile, you still have to trust the method by which that consensus was achieved, like the voting system itself, right? Right. And which question even got how brought up? To, yeah, like what what's being voted yeah. on is like not even a matter of public selection. It's just like, all right, we've decided behind closed doors. These are your options, A or B. It's like, that's how you raise children. You know, it's like, do you want the peas or the carrots? You have to choose one. It's like, I don't want peas or carrots. <laughs> so so direct democracy would, would speak to uh, proxies and, and other tools, right? Because I'm really in the favor of uh, basically trust networks, et cetera. And, uh, you know, so I, th I think anyways, but that's where I go with it. I think, I think uh, the, the problem yeah. is that it's an idealistic uh, 
proposition where you say, oh, we don't need uh, all these people between us and the decision making process. But like every law and every uh, amendment to a law is going to be like a huge uh, poll of the whole population. Mm -hmm. And that's too much. It's not like Brexit where you have one question every decade, but you know, hundreds of decisions a day and uh, you're asking all the people to stop work just yeah. for a minute and, and give their answer. That's not suitable. Yeah. That's not working. Uh, yeah, while they're systematically right uninformed, the misinformed. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like I think you're headed the same direction I am. You know, like okay. Rationally ignorant, okay. uninformed, misinformed. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. It's like, yeah. And it doesn't scale. Yeah. yeah. And, and, right. in, and in the end, who, like he says here, Dan, who gets to draft the laws that people are voting on? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's still mm -hmm. a, some control mechanism there. Who gets to explain the meaning of the laws to the voters? So even right. direct, direct democracy still has this dependence upon people in power and control. And then it presupposes, well, it begs the question, how did they get there? Not only yeah, that, but yeah. even the representatives, uh, don't always understand the full meaning of the laws that they're voting on. Mm -hmm. or, or Cryptocurrency. <laughs> no, even in the, in the, you know, right. the regular government <laughs> with their fiat currency. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't read all their... No, they but don't. that's great. Okay, uh, so... I love having this book. Uh, it's, it's right there for reference. So thanks for the, 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 the uh, input on that one. That's great. Mm-hmm. True democracy. And now we get to sort of the, the final chunk here. True democracy. Bring it on home. So like, bring it on home. And so basically, Dan is saying that uh, a true democracy is to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, then it must have the following properties. Oh, wait, it didn't have quotes. Did you see that? At the beginning of the book, he, he had the same phrase, for the people, by the people. I, I, I feel Public bad. I missed this the quoted. first time I edited Go up. But uh, number 10. <laughs> At the beginning of the chapter, it's I quoted. just must have read that as full, <laughs> fully or something. It should be full, trans fully transparent to all, not failure transparent to all. Oops, sorry. Right here, right on me. Of, by, and oh, for. Yeah, Those we, are quotations. It's all there. quoted. <laughs> and at the end, it's not. Yeah. Here he's just. Well, here, yeah, and here he's not even, I guess he quote, but, but he sort of, it's more like a sentence. If the purpose of democracy is to be a government of, by, and for the people. Could be quoted, yeah. Right. What did you find that, that was wrong? No, I think, I think, I mean, quotes as like a sarcastic device because the current government is not actually by, for, of the it's people. It's broken. But. Yeah. Now he's presenting yeah. what it actually is here, and that's why it's not in quotes here. I think so too. Yeah. Slick. <laughs> it must have the following properties. And this sort of summarizes a lot of what we just went over in the book, right? Composed of independent yep. people, independence defined as the ability for the minority to secede, resistance to covert control by the minorities, the 0.01%, survive a systematically misinformed population, which is certainly what we have, Aggregate wisdom from local knowledge, which we don't have. No, not require individuals to possess, possess global knowledge. Empower the individual rather than disempower. Protect, protect the majority from the minority. Protect, protect the minority from the majority. Failure. Here's the typo. Failure transparent to all. Should be fully transparent to all. Oh, I think that's, 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 that's a. No, that's a, no. I think it's okay. If if there is a failure, it should be transparent to all. I think that's... Uh, well, yes, you know? that's true. That's but true. It's not it's even I, I read that too. It, was, it kind of reads weird, but I do not think it's a, a word. Mistake. It is, it's not a mistake. I think it is. <laughs> I, I, well, it, first of all, like failure transparent to all isn't even like a grammatically correct sentence. Correct. So, right. That's true. So there, there's a grammatical error in that sentence. Yes, it's not even doesn't really make sense. So it needs some ex extra words to use the word failure, or it needs to just be a completely different. Failure we'll ask the man. Be. Failure yeah. of being trans because this is a, a 
need some work. This is a like list of things failure. that should that it should be right. These are supposed to be like affirmative statements, right? Yeah, and failure right. should failure be, transparent, should to be all. transparent to all. Oh, failure should be transparent. I see. There's like a missing should be. Okay, that that makes failure work. Failure transparent to all. I got mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yeah, it makes well, sense they, in that respect. It, it it speaks to the accountability piece, right? So if there is failure, are we yep. are, are we being are we being notified and therefore all can right. make those in charge accountable? I think it should be obviously transparent to all. I I recant, but I think it could be rephrased better. Yeah, but but I Definitely see what you mean. Rephrased. Some of these are yeah. The reading of this, you have to kind of go to what. How, yeah, it's it's right. It's a little, a little math, mathy. Also, it's a little mathy, like with this game theory wow. approach mm -hmm. and trying to isolate these uh, specific uh, corners to uh, putting the the whole uh, puzzle together. Uh, failure transparent. Uh, failure should be transparent. You know. I'm deleting this yeah, question because it's, it's it's not a question. Because look, if you go to number eleven, it follows on number ten. Number ten says failure transparent to all. Number eleven says process to recover from failure obvious to all. Yeah, I think he just needs some prepositions in here, like should be, think, which is. Yeah. I think it's okay when you have a list of properties. You don't have to have a fully structured sentence because the no, should no, no. be yeah. at the top of the whole list. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just not, for anything that can make it more intelligible. but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But either way, so we uh, also we need to empower people to reach a new consensus and not overly biased towards the status quo. Does anyone know, I was just wondering when reading this book, did Dan have like a, a writer to help him or did he write this himself? Do we know? I think he just wrote it himself and then had an editor go over it and then had me and Mike and a few other people go over it and edit it again. Um, but yeah, he wrote it himself. I mean, you, you've seen his articles and his blogs. He's quite the writer actually. Yeah. Rare human can code and write human words at the same time. Mind boggling. It is. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, well, that, that final, was only that final three hours almost. <laughs> no, was it? Two <laughs> yeah. hours and 31 minutes. A, sure, you know, not so bad. Well, that's, yeah, not quite three. That's just um, counting the live minutes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, I feel like we should read that last paragraph just to like seal the deal. A true democracy establishes a process for many to many dispute resolution and compromise that is resistant to capture of a covert minority. It is a system that people voluntarily participate in to escape the law of the jungle. It should protect the minority from the majority and the majority from the minority. A true democracy is a process by which rights are discovered and enforced with the true consent of the people. Experience tells us that dino systems fail to deliver the promise of true democracy. We need a new approach. Yeah, this last section just summarizes the whole thing. We didn't have to do any of this two and a half hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's, our, there's our TLDR. Check, check the end of the book. Maybe it summarizes the whole book. <laughs> yeah, I've been actually looking. There aren't many chapters where he does that, I don't think. Hmm. Do you guys ever do that question in school where it's like the very first thing it says is read all of these questions before you answer them? Oh. And then you start and the you read them and like, says, oh, you, you, you hand it in. You don't have to answer anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The last one says, just write your name. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, point out that uh, next week, uh, it's really, it looks like it's shorter so uh, maybe we'll get like in and out like in an hour um and uh throw that in the mix to see how that feels or in and out yeah. within an hour and a half or something I mean, no that next week sections. next week is two chapters though yeah so rough, okay 20 pages a week is the rough goal oh 20 pages okay okay so okay, we're but, gonna get uh yeah, go ahead. maybe we need a timer and uh and calculate how many minutes per page and uh just uh move along or another another idea is to maybe split it into two parts, um, like maybe three people for the first part and three people for the second part, and give people like a different time to go. Hmm. 
or do two separate do two things simultaneously in different i don't know that'd be weird i don't like doing this with everybody this isn't so bad we just got oh this was good yeah yeah i would i would not want to sacrifice what we were able to do today in order to like slim down Hmm. FYI, the, the next two chapters are really only 17 pages if you just count pages with text. Um, Another option is to uh, extend this instead of 11 weeks. Do it uh, in 15 weeks. I don't know. No, we have to hurry. We need, we need our we'll TLDR be, now so we can spam we'll be dead by the world then. Before, we, before we lose our <laughs> ability to communicate. I need to have my facial recognition to access the internet. So oh, okay. exactly. we need to hurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you guys can handle like this is a you know, it's a lot of time to put aside on a Friday morning, but if we're willing to do it, I'm willing to do it. Hey guys, just to be clear, I have three hours. It's not a problem uh, I mean, for the, for the most part. Uh, so there you go. But uh, I also work, so you know <laughs> I'll make it make it sometimes, and I may, won't make it other times. But if I make it, three hours is okay. I yeah. mean, it's not not too exhaustive, but uh, bringing it down to a swift, uh, if we can improve it, that'd be fine. But the context is what's most important. Get it out there, speak to it, and move on. If you can't do it under three hours, that's fine. I think uh, there's going to be a rotation of people that are going to participate. Yeah. So that's OK yeah. also. Yep. Brandon and I will be the keystones <clears throat> to this one, and but a lot of people hopefully come and go. and share their insights i did kind of like jesse's idea in a way i just kind of don't want to miss out on any of the overviews so like splitting into separate groups like i have a feeling like this is going to happen again and this is just the first pass and maybe like the next group that goes through this and takes it further um yeah. will have less work uh, to do brandon you wouldn't you'd be in both groups like Chris and Brandon would be in both groups, like both time slots. And then your guests could oh, choose. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, we. I'm open to doing it that way if it would be. On the other hand, we could kind of do it this way and then the guests can hop in and out of the same single stream so we don't have to create two separate streams if that's. But is right, there a. Do. The reason why you'd want to do it the other way is just to have less people so you know more a person can maybe talk more um mm. per group if you'd want to go that way what do you guys well, you know, think how about, how about we take this work. off of the live stream and we can we'll close this one up in the uh, spirit of those who are watching yeah. and maybe we can figure it out after well, for next week great yeah, idea. and bravo bravo to mo and nuno and uh Ola and everybody that jumped in the comments and uh, we really appreciate all the all the feedback and the little notes of support are really cool to have along the way so thanks and we'll see you next Friday thanks with yeah. something Thank you guys you can everyone. hang out I'll just end the broadcast